Am I the asshole for calling my best friend creepy for sleeping with my little sister? Hi Reddit, I'm honestly at a loss right now and need some outsider's perspective. So my, 27 female, parents died in a car accident a few months ago, and now my sister Lily, 18 female, is staying with me at my apartment. I love having Lily here. I didn't get to see her as much after I moved to the city where we're currently living, and my job. It was a much smoother transition than I expected. I reintroduced her to my best friend Cole, 27 male, almost right away, and they seemed to get along fairly well. My sister's birthday was in July, and the night after it, she went to a new 18 plus club that opened in our area. I didn't think much of it and just wanted her to be safe. After that night, Lily seemed more stressed, and I assumed it was because of her first year at college coming up. She's taking online courses for the first year, and just tried to give her advice on how to handle it. Yesterday, after Cole came over to drop off some brownies he had baked, my sister came up to me with tears in her eyes and admitted that she had bumped into Cole on the night after her birthday, and they ended up sleeping together. I was shocked, but from how sad and ashamed Lily seemed, I asked if Cole had taken advantage of her. Lily said no, and that it was 100% consensual, but Cole asked her to keep it a secret. Lily didn't want to stress me out and was afraid of me being mad at her, but she couldn't hold it in much longer. After reassuring Lily that I wasn't mad at her and that she was completely right for telling me, I went to my room and angrily called Cole. I yelled at him over the phone and told him how creepy it was that he screwed my freshly 18-year-old sister and that he was way too old to be messing around with girls her age. We went back and forth for a bit before finally hanging up and I went back to talking to Lily about this. Cole told his family and our mutual friends what happened. During the night and even this morning, I've been bombarded with texts from them saying that I was an asshole for calling Cole creepy and that since it was a consensual sexual encounter with Lily being of age, it shouldn't matter. I haven't shown Lily the texts, I don't want to make her feel worse than she already is. With how consistent everyone has been with calling me an asshole, I'm wondering if I really am. So, am I the asshole for calling my best friend creepy for sleeping with my little sister? Edit, yes, I realized I made it sound like Cole and Lily only met after our parents' death, but she's known him before. Granted, they didn't talk much to my knowledge back then since she was a kid and I didn't include her in what I was doing very often. Edit 2, it's just Cole's mum, dad, and brother who are harassing me about this outside of our friends, and at this point, I think that he might have twisted the story for them to get this riled up over what I said. In the comments, Leaks G says, 100% creepy. Also, she just had a massively traumatic event happen. He also told her to lie to you knowing that she just lost her parents. Highly manipulative and weird. He isn't a good guy. Not the asshole. Also adding it's creepy as hell that he asked her to keep it a secret? What the hell? He knew exactly what he was doing. Cole isn't your friend OP, and you really need to look at your circle and question those who are defending him. Right? Like this girl is effing vulnerable, and you as a grown ass man sleep with her and then tell her to lie to her only living immediate family. What the hell? That girl must be going through it. I feel so bad for her. Update. Hey Reddit, these past four days have been busy, but I'm back with an update. To start off with, I ended up talking to Lily about what happened that night, and she ended up revealing that shortly after I reintroduced Cole to her, he began texting her, saying that he wanted to help her grieve. Lily had told Cole about her plan to go to that club, and by the time Cole had shown up, she was decently tipsy. Lily had woken up in Cole's bed the next morning, and after he had woken up too, he told my sister to lie about what happened by saying that she was at a friend's house because I would consider it to be a betrayal of my trust if I knew they slept together. After further discussion, Lily and I decided that grief counselling was best for her. Lily said that she regretted not getting it at the start because to her, that's what started this. As for Cole's family and our friends, I decided to ask them what they were told in two separate group chats. I was effing right that he didn't tell them what actually happened. His family was under the impression that Cole and Lily had told me already what had happened at first and that I seemed okay with it, but when Lily wanted to talk further, I blew up at him out of the blue. 
I told them what actually happened, and while Cole's family seemed hesitant to believe me, they'd said they would talk to Cole. As for our friends, they believed me, and while some apologized, some were saying that it shouldn't have been an issue in the first place because my sister was legal, so I had to drop those people. I've blocked Cole, and I haven't confronted him further, but I'm preparing myself for the worst when I do. Also, to clarify some things, I'm a woman first of all, and second of all, I don't think Cole had ever romantically liked me the past 15 years of us being friends. There just hasn't been any sign of that. But then again, this proves that I don't know him as well as I thought, so I don't know. Thank you for all the advice, and I'll update again if anything comes out of this. In the comments, Defreak1 says, It's creepy that their relationship started with him consoling her regarding the grief. Still feels like she was taken advantage of, emotionally, not physically, although you have no context between Tipsy and her waking up in the bed. Creepy. Help with grief? By getting his willy wet? He was definitely out of line, and you just know that he would have gone for her when she was younger if it was legal. Good on you for being such a good sister that she felt comfortable coming to you with this moral dilemma. She is a victim, but somehow was convinced that she was in the wrong for this. Screw Cole. Update 2. I wanted to post an update a few days ago, but I felt emotionally and mentally exhausted. Per your guy's advice, I asked Lily if she actually remembered having sex with Cole, and she said that she remembered Cole buying her a drink, and then later on, Cole convinced Lily and her friend who was tagging along with her to let Lily go home with him. Lily remembers getting in the Uber and being inside of Cole's living room and bedroom, but not the sex itself. I mentioned that it's possible Cole drugged her with that drink, and if he did, then it's assault, and Lily can press charges against him. Lily said if he did, she would want to press charges against Cole. We both got a bit emotional afterwards, and I apologized to Lily for not noticing that something was wrong when it first happened. As for Cole's parents, they threatened to cut him off financially if he didn't tell them the truth, and Cole admitted to what Lily said in the first post. Cole's parents apologized to me over the phone, and I told them what Lily said, and if he did drug her, then there's a possibility that we'll be pressing charges against Cole. They seemed to accept that and apologized one more time for harassing me before hanging up. Also, while clearing my phone of Cole-related things, pictures, videos, calendar dates, etc., I remembered a time when he was picking me up from a concert when we were 18 to 19. He looked at my outfit when I got into the car and mentioned how easy it would be for someone at the concert to rip it off and take advantage of me. I'll be honest, I was far more timid and more afraid of confrontation, so despite feeling weird about his comment, I brushed it off so we wouldn't fight over it. So there's one red flag I missed and regret not mentioning. Like I said in the last update, thank you all for your support and advice. I'll update again if anything major comes up. Oh, and I'm changing all my passwords, probably my apartment door lock too, that Cole has access to just in case he tries anything. In the comments, Chonkosaurus Rex says, Imagine being 27 years old, having known a kid since she was three, and as she's grieving the loss of her parents and having her whole world turned upside down, you find her when she is freshly 18 and tipsy, take her home to sleep with her, and when she wakes up, you tell her not to tell her sister. Imagine being that person and not thinking you're a freaking creep. He knows he's a creep. He knows exactly what he did, and his actions show that it was premeditated. He was just waiting for his chance. Even if it was consensual, which I have doubts, this girl just turned 18 and had recently suffered a great loss. She's vulnerable. He took advantage of her. The guy is 100% a creep. Read this out loud to my 29-year-old husband and our 27-year-old best friend. They both instantly made the connection with my 19-year-old sister and retched. Absolutely not. She was already tipsy when he met up with her, and it sounds like she ended up drunk enough that she didn't remember it at all. No way that was consensual. I think Cole's creepiness is proven by the fact that he told so many people that he had slept with OP's sister. Also, sleeping with a drunk 18-year-old at his age is super extra creepy. That's just a skeevy, gross move. 
In what world is there an okay situation for a 27-year-old man to intentionally meet up with a freshly 18-year-old girl who just lost her parents, is now drunk, and then sleep with her? That's heinously gross. My instinct would have been to get her home safely and then call my supposed best friend to let her know that her underage, depending on the country, little sister is home safe. Also, when your defense is, she's legal. No. Am I the asshole for not inviting my siblings to my wedding? My sister, 34 female, and her husband, 36 male, just got married three months ago. I, 30 female, was appointed maid of honor. I was so excited to help her plan her wedding, and I took on most of the work since I was unemployed at the time, and she is a doctor. I won't get into details, but take note, she didn't have a wedding planner. It was all me. The time leading up to the wedding, I was miserable because of how the bride treated me. I felt like her own personal slave that she felt she could kick around because she's the bride. Just because you're a bride doesn't mean you get a free pass to be a beer. Many times, I just wanted to step out of the wedding party, but I kept telling myself to just bite my tongue and keep the peace because she's probably just stressed. After doing so much for her, she refused to invite my fiancé even though we've been together for 12 years, but invited my siblings' partners who have been around for only 2-3 to three years. My sister and her guy dated for a year before they got engaged, so we don't really know him too well. She said she didn't want my fiancé around because people would be asking about my own wedding since they've all been wanting us to get married for a while. I refused to do any more work for her wedding until she apologized to me and invited my fiancé, which she did. Not exactly sincerely, but whatever. I was hurt that she wasn't even grateful for anything that I had done for her and her dream wedding because it was expected of me to help. Cut to the day of the wedding and everything was fine. The ceremony was beautiful and the couple was happy. I was happy for my sister. By the time we got to the reception venue, I noticed that my fiancé and I were on a separate table from my family. They were at the VIP table, and I was cast aside to sit at the furthest table right beside the kitchen. I figured there was a mistake, and I calmly asked the bride about it since she handled the seating plan. She looked me dead in the eye and said there is no mistake. That's where we belong. At the kids' table and far away. We were seated with 7-14 to 14 year olds. The groom overheard us and agreed with me, but kept quiet when my sister gave him this don't you dare disagree with me look. At the end of the night though, the groom did apologize to my parents for what happened to me and said he had no clue his bride did that, but he didn't say a word to me as his bride told him not to. Because of this, I decided to not make an issue of it and just try to enjoy the remainder of the night with my partner, but I wouldn't make a maid of honor speech. My parents noticed where I was and got upset at the situation as well. My siblings knew very well that I wasn't at their table, but didn't bother looking for me or wondering why I wasn't seated there. When they heard that I wasn't making a speech, my two brothers walked to my table to tell me off, saying that I had to understand my sister and the stress of being a bride. Be nice to her because it's her special day and you're only a bride once. Yeah, right. I bet they'll divorce that I'm a disgrace and a disgusting disappointment for not doing a speech for my sister, that I would make my sister sad and I was being selfish making the night about me, when I was literally quiet in our corner. Needless to say, I wasn't having the best time, so we got up and left. We ended up in McDonald's for dinner and I posted a story of us getting burgers saying, post wedding meal. I made sure that I posted it after the reception ended to not make it look like I ditched, but my siblings saw this as an attack to my sister somehow. Up to this day, the bride said she did nothing wrong, and her reasoning for putting me there was one, I didn't plan her wedding exactly like she envisioned during the process, so I deserved to sit there, when I was doing everything she told me she wanted. Two, she didn't like that I looked pretty in my gown. And three, I needed to be punished for insisting on bringing my fiancé. I didn't plan for my own wedding yet, as I wanted to be 100% focused on hers. Plus, she banned me from getting married before her since she's older. Again, because I didn't want the drama, I agreed. But now I just don't want anyone there except my parents and a few close friends. 
My parents agree with me, but my siblings are upset calling me childish, but to be completely honest, I just don't feel like paying for shit people. Mine is a destination wedding, and my fiancé and I are paying for everything. These are our savings, and I don't feel like splurging on these people. They, along with my grandparents and cousins, are all saying I'm wrong. But hey, if I was excluded from being a sibling at my sister's wedding, and no one cared, then why would you be upset if I excluded you in return? In the comments, Jungle Rumble 19 says, Not the asshole. You can't choose your family, but you can choose who you spend your time with. Your sister and your siblings are assholes. The fact that an educated doctor can state that you need to be punished and not realize how middle school child she's being really shows her garbage character. She's also outsourced the entire wedding planning to you for free and then thought that it was okay to use you as a punching bag. Good for you for standing up to her about your fiance. What an absolutely ridiculous reason to exclude him. Again, how anyone with any basic self-awareness can say these things is just beyond me. I personally would be going no contact with all but your parents and then build your own family from friends who actually appreciate you and treat you with respect. Not the asshole. Your sister was a mega cow to you and your siblings supported her acting horribly to you. You have the right to invite only people who want to be at your wedding and that are supportive of you and your partner. Your siblings clearly don't meet this criteria. Your sister is nasty and your siblings are no better. Cutting ties with all of them is well worth it. Make sure your parents see how you actually treat people. Don't waste your time or money on horrible people. I would have left as soon as I saw where I was seated and made sure the parents and groom knew why. I'd love to know if there's any long-standing shitty behavior that OP has normalized, because that's what family bullies do. Normalize dysfunction. Absolutely do not invite your siblings, and if your parents pressure you, disinvite them. I'd send Dr. Sister a bill for my time planning her wedding. Yeah, I feel like a lot of people would go a lot of different ways on this one. Me personally, that's enough disrespect that I can deal with, although I'd like to think that in a perfect world, I do exactly what this last comment said. Leaving as soon as I saw where I was seated, making sure the parents and groom knew why, but a lot of the time, and for a lot of families, I'd imagine that's way more trouble than it's worth, even though it's the right thing to do. I'd imagine they could shitstorm Monkey Circus up enough of a reason that the treatment that you received from the bride was now justified because you're childish and you're putting on a show, you're, you're ruining the wedding. So not the asshole for taking a middle ground approach to this one, and I'd say putting yourself in the best situation for where this could lead to in the future. Update. Hi again. So, I'll answer a few questions and leave a quick update. I, 30 female, come from a family of 5 kids. I failed to mention this because I didn't think that it was all that relevant, but I actually have 2 sisters, 34 and 32, and 2 brothers, 26 and 22. A little more on my sisters. They are the best of friends. They're the picture-perfect model of sisterly love, while I'm the middle child with 2 younger brothers. So, why did I agree to be maid of honor? Well, because I thought that it would bring us closer. In my mind, I believed that this was her trying to be more of a sister to me. You always hear stories of that sisterly bond around weddings, and I tried to nurture that because that's what they had. And that sibling bond is what my brothers had with each other as well. Any chance I'd get to connect with my sisters, I'd jump at the opportunity. It's more me just feeling left out than being a doormat. I was a very sickly child, and that's why I was mostly with just my parents growing up while my siblings would be going out, meeting friends, etc. Which is what my siblings envied, apparently. They aren't close to my parents. Bride had both of us as maid of honors because she couldn't just choose one. I later found out that I was always the second option, and I was just appointed maid of honor so I'd do all the work while the other maid of honor got all the praise which in hindsight, I should have seen coming. While my brothers were busy harassing me about giving my maid of honor speech, Sister 2 was giving her own maid of honor speech about how she absolutely loves the bride and will do anything for her. All that crap. She then conveniently calls all the siblings at the stage to toast to the bride and groom when I was crying and rushing out and walking away from my brothers. 
so to the other relatives in attendance, I was making a scene and making it about me. No, it's not the first time she hurt me. She fat shamed me as a child, calling me a potato, saying things like I was a burden to the family because of my epilepsy, throwing all my makeup in the sink and wetting it because I moved her bath towel in the bathroom, calling me the stupid low IQ sister even if I'm a licensed architect with a master's degree when her guy friends wanted to ask for my number, taking my dream church from me, which is why my fiancé said that we would do a destination wedding at my dream country instead. It's just the worst she's done to spite me in front of the entire family. And no, we still haven't spoken since then, and she still maintains that I was the one who ruined everything by getting upset about the seating. Now for the update. 1. We will elope. Just the two of us and a handful of close friends that were there for us since the beginning of our relationship will have a small church wedding and a little celebration on the beach with the people that we love, our chosen family, followed by island topping with our entire party around the Philippines, all paid by us, because I will spend on memories and experiences for people that love and appreciate us. The budget that we set aside for a wedding in Italy will be put to an intimate five-day wedding celebration on an island in the Philippines. Two, we will have our reception with the family when we get home. The plan is to invite both our big families to a luncheon the weekend after. Collectively, this would mean about 80 guests max. Both our parents wanted to help pay for the engagement party and rehearsal dinner. They agreed to pay for the luncheon and reception instead, meaning they could invite whomever they please. They handle the guest list, so if my siblings are invited, I couldn't care less because I'll be too busy with my husband of one to two weeks by then. Here we can still have the father-daughter dance and a few other things like cake slicing, etc. We'll have piñatas, a brick oven pizza cart, coffee and pretzels, and an amazing Italian buffet with a pasta bar, lots of fresh fruit, and cheese. Because who doesn't like cheese? As for the seating plan, ever watched Mamma Mia 1? <laughs> yep. Think that, a long winding table where my siblings can be as far away from me as possible and as close to the service area as possible without it being obvious because they'll all be together at their own siblings table. We'll be in the center with my fiance, his two brothers, and our parents will be next to us while my wonderful sibs are at the end of the table by the restrooms where they belong. I don't care at all if they're invited to this lunch because I really have nothing left for them, not even anger. I'm just so done with them that I'd feel more for a stranger on the street than I would for these people. It's indifference. They've hurt me so many times that I am numb to their existence. 3. No bridezilla allowed. My sister expects to be my maid of honor in return. Definitely not going to happen since my siblings won't be present in the ceremony. I do not need her around. I do not want her around. Yes, she will be invited out of courtesy to the reception most likely, but I'll make sure that she's set aside like I was. How so? We recently found out she's pregnant, so I'm planning my wedding around her due date. Oh well. Luckily, she's due around June, which really was the month that we wanted anyway. So if she does decide to attend with a newborn and her huz, well then, she's going to be at the kiddie table and then told to step out when the baby starts to cry. In the end, our wedding day is for us, and eloping is the only way I feel like we could just sit and enjoy our special day together away from all my siblings and family issues. Then we get back, have a get-together lunch with some good food and good fun, which is really all it is to me, a lunch. Luckily, fiancé's family isn't as insane as mine is. So there you have it. Thank you for all your messages and comments and insights. I really was going a bit loco back then, thinking I was overreacting, but thank you so much for the clarity. Cheers to the end of this emotionally draining year. In the comments, loveanimal 735 says, That sounds perfect. I love it. Small weddings are so much fun instead of the headache of a big wedding. No drama, no stress, easy and fun and loving like it should be. Congratulations, and I want an update on how your wedding trip went. Definitely do an update. OP says, We'll let you all know how it goes. Right now we're deep into planning mode and we're simply just enjoying the process. Don't let your parents deter you from your plans. And OP says, Oh, they definitely won't, but thank you for the concern. 
from either side. <laughs> Both our grandparents were very problematic to our parents for their weddings, so they're pretty hands off when it comes to our plans. Good for you. Your sisters are assholes, and according to your other post, I'm guessing it all stems from the fact that you're prettier than they are and they are jealous. Your brothers don't understand and or are afraid of your oldest sister, so they're on her side to avoid the hell she will unleash on them. Opie said they're jealous of the attention she got for being sickly when she was a kid. Sometimes parents can be a bit preoccupied with a sick child that they wind up neglecting the other kids. If that's the case here, then the Sibs would have good reason to be angry, but they're mad at the wrong person. OP didn't ask for any of this. Anyway, these people are adults and they need to get their shit together. They're old enough to realize none of this is OP's fault. OP says, My parents were actually very supportive and did all they could to be as fair to all of us, so I really can't put fault on them. They're really amazing parents. I wasn't treated any different. I just didn't have many friends being absent from school so constantly, so I'd hang out with my mum. She's honestly my best friend. It was okay growing up, but the jealousy really was evident when we were in our 20s for whatever reason. Parents are allowed to be closer to one child if the others treat them like trash. Yeah, this ain't close to being over. Brothers are going to be mad for not being invited on the trip and shit, sister's going to be mad for not being maid of honor when she did it for her, and other sister is going to be mad because original sister Bridezilla is mad. Just cut the siblings off. And the parents. Opie's hate towards her siblings are valid, but she's vastly missing the huge puzzle piece who could have set everyone straight. Opie's parents didn't do shit to stop their kids from harassing their other kid. They kept silent, just went along with everything to keep the peace. They didn't care enough about OP to stand up for her. They are enablers. Parents are just as much assholes as siblings, which OP does not want to accept. I don't know about that one. Like, I can absolutely understand where they're coming from there, but without me being personally in OP's shoes and experiencing everything that's gone on from childhood until now... I'm not sure if the parents are particularly to blame. I can see a universe in which they are, in which they're stepping out of it, but if those two groups of older and younger siblings are as bad as OP makes them out to be, I don't know if there is much that the parents can do to put out this fire. Maybe OP is leaving out the part where the parents did try to sit down with these siblings and have a come to God moment with them that didn't work? Because who knows, maybe for whatever reason they're going to hold these experiences against OP for no good reason, and it's never going to be something that OP can just get over with them. There are definitely things in life that no matter how hard you try, you're going to have others that will never get over something as I'd say menial as like their parent-child connection being a bit stronger than yours. Some grudges are just like that. Our next post is by user Sodub1234, titled, I, 24 female, found out that my husband, 35 male, made a disgusting bet with his friends when he met me, and now I can't see him the same way. He, 35 male, is friends with my, 24 female, stepbrother, 36 male, since they were in college. And to be honest, they were always respectful to me, and I never knew they were bad enough to do what they did to me. I thought they respected me for being their friend's younger sister, but I was wrong. To put you in context, their group of friends dissolved when they grew up and followed different paths, and a few days ago they decided to meet again. Well, that meeting was held at my house, and at one point during dinner, one of his friends started saying things like he, my husband, was very lucky that our thing worked out. And when he said that, some laughed, and my stepbrother and my husband got very nervous. So I asked what he was talking about. And when my husband tried to shut him up, I knew something was wrong. So I asked the same thing again. He told me that when my stepbrother introduced us, he told them that I was really arrogant and a loser and that I needed someone to teach me a lesson. And I admit, I was very arrogant. I used to be annoying because I thought that no one was smarter than me and that they were all idiots. Well, they, except my stepbrother, decided to bet to see who would get to sleep with me first. Evidently it was my husband and we've been together ever since. This happened six years ago. 
And I would feel less hurt if he had always been an asshole because it would be my fault for falling in love with someone like that. But he is always so sweet and cute to me since we started talking that I would never have thought that he was making fun of me behind my back. When his friends said that, everyone shut up because my face said it all. I got so pissed off that I just laughed and went to our room. My husband followed me and began to swear to me that he is no longer like that, that he loves me, and that he regrets what an asshole he was before he met me. And even though we talked a lot and I tried to forgive him, I can't look at him the same way. This morning, he went with me to my appointment with the doctor because I'm pregnant, and when he cried when he saw our baby, I was disgusted, because I don't know if he was being sincere or not. I don't know when I'll trust him again, but I want to do it, but I can't. Does that even make sense? Could things go back to the way they were before this mess? Man, this is so much like the dead ex sending that letter to OP and the other one where OP only married his wife because it helped him progress his career in the company that his wife's dad owned. Like, damn. I can understand why these people don't tell these incredibly damaging secrets, but it's not the right thing to do to hold on to them. Especially when it's obvious that a group of friends from your past can come and will mention it when they come back into your life and meet up. Much like in that company story, he knew that his friends would say some shit like that. In this one, how does he not know that his old friends are going to bring up this bet, which is completely the basis of your relationship with your wife? Just that attitude of, don't worry about it, she'll be right. I don't have to put out this fire before it starts. I'm sure the fire will not be an issue. It baffles me. It really baffles me. And I don't know answers to questions like this when they arise OP, but I, I really hope for the best. In the comments, Soflark2018 says, A bunch of 29-year-olds make a bet to have sex with and humiliate an 18-year-old in order to put her in her place. That is extremely disgusting. They are a bunch of predators, your stepbrother included for being friends with these kinds of people. They are all idiots, and she definitely is smarter than them. It's like the plot of She's All That and Cruel Intentions, but gross. It's supposed to be two immature high school kids, not one kid and a grown-ass adult man. Update Kinda Sorta, titled... Am I the asshole for forcing my husband to celebrate his birthday only with me because I don't like his family? Edits. A few weeks ago, I found out about a horrible bet that he had made with his friends about me before we started dating, and it was not easy to forgive him. So I told him that I would forgive him if he didn't invite his family. That's why I say I forced him in the title. The thing is, my husband comes from a family that really doesn't know what boundaries are. Ever since they found out I'm pregnant, they tell me what to eat, what to wear, how to act, etc., and I can't stand them anymore. I tried a thousand times to like them, but I can't. They are really overwhelming. I'm about to give birth, and I just want peace, and I know that with them that's impossible. So I asked my husband to go to a restaurant to celebrate his birthday because I wanted to be at peace at home. He refused because he said he wanted to stay with me. So I told him not to invite his family then because they get on my nerves. And at first he didn't like the idea so much because he never celebrated a birthday party without his family, but then he accepted. So we celebrated just the two of us at our house and of course his family got mad at us, especially me because they know that it was me who didn't want them to come. But I don't regret the decision I made, because it's the first time in six years that I've dared to face them and tell them not to do something that I don't like. So am I the asshole? In the comments, what's my password 73 says, Not the asshole, but I'm sad your youth was stolen. You've been with him since you were 18, and he was 30? You're right at that stage where your frontal lobe is nearly fully developed, so if you get the urge to divorce him, don't ignore it. Update. On my first post, I got a lot of nice comments and even messages, so I thought that it would be a good idea to post an update. 
After I found out about the bet, we had so many fights that we thought it was the end of our marriage and decided to start couples therapy hoping for the best, and thanks to that, we were able to move on. He apologized many times, and we had many long talks on this matter, but today, I can say that everything is in the past. Today, we have a beautiful 7-month-old baby girl, and I am 5 months pregnant, and to be honest, I've never been happier. Of course, there are days where I think about what he did, but then I think about the present and what he is today, and I forget about everything because the truth is that he is another person now. Well, he was never really mean to me because from the moment we started talking, he was always caring and sweet. Only now I know that everything is genuine and he's not faking it. Although according to him, he never faked anything because he liked me a lot when he knew me intimately. I don't think our marriage is perfect because from time to time we have fights, but for that reason we are still working on our relationship, because we love each other, and we want this to work, and we want to grow old together. So that's all, there isn't much more to say. Thank you for your kind comments and messages. In the comments, Snoo says, Nothing fixes marital issues like two babies in less than a year, am I right? Right? A 30 year old banging an 18 year old is a bet? Completely normal. OP fell directly into every creep's dreams. Marriage and two babies before she knows what red flags look like. She's trapped herself and calls it love. Yeah, they basically made a bet to see who could baby trap a teen fastest, and the worst man won. Makes sense why he never told her, wouldn't want to ruin the fairy tale. Don't worry, in about 10 to 15 years, we'll see her back here after her hubby cheats on her with the next 18 year old. Or she's going to be a stay-at-home mom and housewife, and 10 years later she's going to be sick of doing 100% of the housework and 100% of the parenting, living like she's in the 1950s. A fight will probably explode over dinner not being on the table when he walks in the door, and she'll get fed up and want to leave and make threats, but then it hits her. She's never had a job, and she has no skill set, no independence, and no life outside her home. She doesn't have her own money, and she can't support herself, let alone kids. All the credit cards and money accounts, the house, and the cars are all in his name. He'll probably have isolated her from her friends and family, and she's trapped, and she can't leave. Her husband's family will continue to not like her, and only look at her as a human incubator and a slave to her husband. She'll be a 35-year-old woman, realizing she'll never be able to survive without her husband, and it will be exactly what was planned by her husband all those years ago. Please look out for your daughter. You are not surrounded by safe men. You were an innocent child when they started too. Who's to say a new countdown won't start for her? What did your therapist say? Did they call out his predatory and grooming actions? I just don't see a licensed professional mediating with a predator. He was nice and sweet because it was an act to win the bet. I am so sorry that you don't see that, according to him, he never faked anything because he liked me a lot when he knew me intimately. When, not before. It was an act, and then he liked you. After. He's not a good guy. You and your children truly deserve better. I hope you realize that one day. Final update, titled, Am I wrong for wanting to forgive my stepbrother after he made a disgusting bet with my husband about me in the past? So my relationship with my stepbrother at first was really bad. We couldn't even stand each other, which led him to make a bet with his friends to teach me a lesson six years ago. That disgusting bet was that one of them had to manage to sleep with me to, as I said before, teach me a lesson after leaving me. Long story short, my husband was the one who won, and we've been together ever since. And I wish I could say that I always knew about the bet and was dumb enough to decide to marry him, but no. I found out about the bet almost a year ago, and it shattered my world. Thanks to that, I had to go to individual and couples therapy for months because it was difficult for me to forgive my husband. But we both worked for our marriage and our child, and today I can say that we are really happy but I can't say the same for my stepbrother. When I found out about the bet, my husband apologized in a thousand ways and has spent the last few months showing me that he really loves me and never faked anything in our relationship. 
According to him, since we started talking, he liked me and everything was genuine, but my stepbrother never apologized because according to him, I should thank him, because thanks to him I stopped being so annoying and I found the love of my life and the father of my children. And I thought he was joking, but he really meant it, and we had a horrible fight about it, and since he didn't give in, we haven't talked again. He only contacted me a few days ago because it was my 25th birthday. He called me and I didn't pick up the phone, so he left a voicemail saying that he misses me and that he's very sorry, that he now understands that what he did a few years ago was disgusting and that it should have never happened that he knows that I'm pregnant, and that it hurts him to know that he's not going to meet this baby either, that he wants me to be his little sister again, and a lot of other things. And honestly, hearing it after so long broke my heart, because I really do miss him. After I started dating my husband, our relationship improved a lot, and we have come to consider ourselves family, and I was used to counting on him for everything, and now I miss him so much. I want to forgive him and give him another chance, but I don't know. I've asked my friends, my husband, and my family for advice, and they all told me that it's a decision that only I should make, but I'm so confused. Would it be very stupid to forgive him? Am I wrong for that? In the comments, before moving on to letting them back in your life, I'd want to know what happened that he now says that he understood what he did was disgusting. Truthfully, this sounds like something happened to him and not that he had some sort of realization. For me, it's about motive before I let someone who did something terrible to me back into my life. I'd also ask myself why I want to forgive him and let him back in. Now, forgiveness is only something you can do, and it has to be something that gives you peace. Not him, not your husband, not your family. Also, forgiveness doesn't mean that you guys are all sunshine and rainbows either and act like a big happy family. You can forgive and keep him at an arm's length. You can forgive and continue never speaking, as long as it brings you peace. That's what matters. I also wanted to point out that you should take your time in deciding. Just because he left a message doesn't mean you have to immediately reply. Take your time. Posted by user School Play Throwaway, titled, Am I the asshole for not sharing my daughter's school play video with my father after he slept through it? My 35 female, father, 68 male, moved to a different country eight years ago. He tries to visit whenever he can, and I try to help him have as much of a relationship with my children, 9 male, 5 female, and baby girl, as possible. Whenever he visits, however, he tends to act a bit entitled. He either sleeps or hangs out with his old friends in the mornings and afternoons, doesn't help me with anything that I ask him to, and then gets annoyed when he wants to do something at 9pm and the kids are too tired. His excuses are always that he's exhausted from travelling and deserves to get some rest and spend time with friends that he never gets to see anymore. My kids are always excited when my dad visits, but at this point, they see him more when he's facetiming us from a different hemisphere than when he's staying in our guest room. Anyway, he is visiting us now to meet my youngest daughter, who was born in September. He got here two weeks ago and will fly back home in a few days. I've been trying to get him to spend more time with my kids this time around, but he still goes out a lot. My older daughter had her first ever school play on Saturday. She was really excited about it and invited my father. He promised her he would come. The day before the play, my father went out with his friends and didn't come back until 3am. The play started at 11am and we had to get there 30 minutes earlier. In total, he must have gotten about 6 hours of sleep. When we, my dad, my husband, my son and I got there, we sat at one of the first rows. My daughter had asked us to. The play was 40 minutes long. My father fell asleep less than 15 minutes in. I woke him up and he slept again. He snores loudly when he sleeps, so I kept waking him up whenever he slept. Near the end of the play, I was too late to wake him, and he let out a snore that was so loud that some of the kids on the stage looked over at us. At that, I hit his arm a little harder, and he didn't fall back asleep. My husband and I haven't mentioned anything to my daughter, but it's obvious that she noticed. She was heartbroken after the play, and dismissed any of our attempts to talk about it. 
My husband filmed the play for my mum and stepdad, who were with our baby during it. Instantly after the play, my dad asked if he could have the video too, since he didn't watch most of it. We are not sharing it with him. I told him that he had the opportunity to watch it live, and instead ruined the experience for all of us, especially my daughter. He doesn't deserve to watch what he missed, just because he decided to stay out late the night before. My dad is pissed. He's telling me and my husband that we're robbing him of his role in my daughter's life. He also maintains the excuse that he was exhausted during the play and needed to get some rest. I really don't think that we're the assholes, but with how tense things have been getting, it might be easier to just let him watch the video. I'm just gonna go with not the asshole for this one, and yeah, it might be easier to just let him watch the video, but I don't think he'll learn his lesson if you do that. I feel like this could be a cornerstone moment for you and him, where you show him by not giving him the video and clapping him down a bit more that he needs to put more effort in to be present for your daughter and actually show up for the rest of the kids. He's a giant asshole for prioritizing time with his friends out of the house over your kids when he said he wants to come over and spend time with your kids and then always does the opposite. So no, not the asshole, and I don't think you would be the asshole for continuing to withhold the video. In the comments, why do you let him stay with you? OP says, he stays with my younger sister sometimes, but her place is much smaller than ours. The rest of my paternal family lives mostly in a different state. It's usually more convenient for him to stay at my apartment. On grandma, OP says, my mom is especially upset about this. She wanted to come to the play, but volunteered to watch my baby so that my dad could go. He's probably just embarrassed that he looked bad and wants to seem like he cares now. And OP says, Yeah, that thought definitely crossed my mind. I'm pretty sure he was embarrassed about the snoring, and it would make sense for him to want the video because of that. For clarification, a commenter says, You need to determine with your dad if he's in town to help with whatever you ask him to, or to visit friends and relax, plus see you and the kids. There is a difference in intent. And OP says, By help me with anything I ask him to, I meant minuscule tasks. Handing over the remote control is too much of an effort sometimes. The most I've asked him to do was pick up takeout that we'd ordered. He was 10 steps away from the door, and I was changing a diaper, and wash his plate after dinner. We have a wash what you use rule. Not the asshole. Rip Van Winkle can get over himself. He's either a grandparent, or he isn't. He doesn't get to party with the boys until 3am, and then expect to be catered to. Not to mention that showing him the video would probably only enable him. He'll 100% keep treating his family like this if he knows they'll have a camera ready for him. Not the asshole. Update. To those who commented on my post, thank you. My father's leaving tomorrow, so I thought I'd give a small update. These past few days, things have been awkward. Mostly because my husband and I were mad at my father, who was mad at us back. A few hours after I wrote my post, my father decided to prove me wrong about my daughter being upset. He sat next to her and tried to get her to talk about the play. He was asking her questions about it, many of which he would know the answer to if he'd stayed awake during it. I'm guessing my daughter understood that, because it only made things worse. She refused to answer his questions, and at one point ran to me crying. I'm not sure if that was my dad's wake-up call, or if it was his daughter refusing to talk to him, as she usually idolizes him. But whatever it was, he apologized to my daughter. Grandpa was really tired, but he loves you very much. She said she forgave him, but was still upset, so he came to me Tuesday night to ask what he could do to fix things before he went home. I helped him brainstorm some ideas. Yesterday, my father surprised the kids with a trip to the aquarium. My daughter had been asking us to go there for a while, but with a newborn at home, we hadn't found the time yet. The kids had a lot of fun there, and my dad let them each get a plushie from the gift shop. Afterwards, we went to McDonald's and took the kids to see Santa at the mall. Overall, my kids had a great day with their grandfather, and my daughter is feeling a lot better. That said, the aquarium, non-fancy food, and old guy in a fake beard are definitely part of my father's idea of hell. So I'm sure I'll hear him complain about all the sacrifices he made for his grandkids for a while, but as long as my kids think he had fun, I'm fine with that. 
I do think he understands that he screwed up though. He's no longer asking us for the video and has promised he'll never show such disregard for things my kids care about again. As some of you suggested, I told him that he'll have to stay with my sister or one of his friends next time he visits. I think he knows the you're keeping me away from my grandkids excuse won't work on me because he hasn't complained about that yet. If he tries to pick a fight over it once he's home, I'll hang up on him. Thanks everyone. In the comments, St. Alvis says, what's he got against aquariums? OP says, he thinks they're boring. Same goes for zoos. Lord, I just sat through a 10 minute explanation of a video game that I don't care about to make my kid happy. There are worse things than being bored. OP says, as someone who watches Paw Patrol every night, I agree. I don't think my father understands that he's not the one who needs to enjoy these things. I get it. My dad was the same way. Some of it's generational, I guess. My friends are just prepping their house for a baby and started painting the banister bright colors. One of their parents said that it looked untidy and you didn't have to do things like that because whilst it is the child's house, it's your home. A completely incomprehensible divide. OK Map says, it's a good start. I'm still not convinced that he'll be prioritizing his grandkids from now on. Out of sight, out of mind. He'll forget all about his embarrassment once he's back home. Don't get me wrong, I'm glad he's made an effort, but let's see what happens next visit. I think you're right to not let him stay with you anymore. If he wants to see you, the onus to make time for that needs to be on him. OP says, Oh, I'm not convinced either. That's why he's not staying with us next time. I don't want my kids to get used to him behaving like this. My sister has a daughter, so I hope he stays with one of his friends instead of her. Would be curious to know what dad was like to OP when she was a child. Usually that would give some sort of a hint as to what kind of grandfather he will be or is being. You'd be surprised. A lot of people, my own grandfather included, do a complete 180 for their grandkids. I assume it's because you get all of the bonding and none of the parenting. Raise his hand. Well into adulthood. I learned that I had a doting paternal grandfather, but my dad? Well, we don't talk about that. Hence why I was an adult before my mum let something slip. Had I known, I would have protested ever visiting my grandpa. Unexposed is by user Hans Wormhat, titled, Teacher has a naughty and nice list. So my son came home today and said his kindergarten teacher, who has been teaching for over 20 years, has a naughty and nice list. He said two kids are on the naughty list. I initially thought that he must be misunderstanding or that it's a joke. I texted another mum with a kid in the class and she said her child said the exact same thing tonight, named the same two naughty kids and said her child is on a pending list because they didn't clean up like they were supposed to today, said her child learned the word pending today because of this. I already messaged a few teacher friends and they've all reiterated that this is not normal or acceptable. I would love some advice on how to approach the situation. I also don't personally ever do a naughty nice Santa is watching thing. I teach my kids to be good because it's the right thing and you want to live somewhere where people do the right thing versus just doing the right thing because someone is watching. So it's also problematic to me in that aspect. I can imagine it would not be fun to parents that don't celebrate Christmas. Cross posting in Mummit. Thanks in advance. In the comments, Environmental Air 678 says, Perhaps volunteer to work with 20 plus students, kindergartners no less, and see what it takes to manage behavior. I get that your Google research about clip charts or whatever supported your bias and Trump's professional knowledge gained by advanced degrees and on the job experience, but do you honestly think the misbehavior is happening in a vacuum? The kids in the class already know who the naughty kids are before they ever get put on a list. Stop being a busybody with, oh golly gee shucks, I didn't mean for it to get to the admin nonsense. You knew what would happen if you told the right person. So silly. OP says, I reached out to seven friends that are educators, all different levels of experience and in different states. All said this is absolutely unacceptable. The school admin said it was absolutely unacceptable. I'm not going off Google, I'm deferring to the people I know in real life and trust who do have degrees in the fields. Kai Emery says, 
I had terrible ADHD that hadn't been diagnosed when I was seven. No amount of public call-out was going to train a neurotransmitter issue out of me. But it did make me feel like shit. I think the expectations of kindergarten are too high these days, too. A lot of adults in these threads have been down with bullying kids and equating bullying with discipline. I don't like that. You can discipline kids without humiliating them. Right? That one guy that keeps going off is like, what other option is there? There are plenty of options that don't include shaming and bullying, which any uneducated, on the topic, person, here could quickly Google. When you remove the holiday affiliation, I don't think it's too different from class behavior clip charts or green-red behavior cards in front of the classroom. The teacher seems to be using it as a behavior management system. These exist without the words naughty and nice. Is your issue solely that this is affiliated with a holiday or that two kids were labeled as naughty slash needing to do better? Because there are many behavior management systems that display or call out students who aren't doing the nice or ideal behavior. If you don't want your child to be participating in holiday classroom activities, tell the teacher so she can make sure not to say things or do things that she shouldn't. She can find other words for naughty or nice. My former school used expected and unexpected behavior. Teachers at my current school, good and sad behavior. OP says, clip charts aren't allowed in their school because of the research around public shaming. Update. Thank you all for your input and advice. I appreciated hearing the different points of view, even the mean ones. Who knew that a naughty and nice list would be so controversial? I sent a short and sweet email to the teacher this morning. Hey, Miss Teacher, I hope your week is going well. My child came home yesterday and told me something that I found concerning. He said there's a classroom naughty and nice list and singled out two kids that are naughty and some that are pending. I'm assuming that this was something said in jest, but just wanted to check with you. Thanks. Well... My friend that works for the school must have brought it up to admin because about an hour later I got a call from the AP apologizing over it. She said she dealt with it swiftly, shut it down, and the lists will be no more. She said she's still trying to wrap her head around someone thinking that that was a good idea. She said she is still processing it, said that it was insensitive, and that kids shouldn't be worried for the next 11 days. I told her that she didn't need to apologize at all and I just felt bad for the kids on the naughty list. Everything she said to me was really reassuring, and I appreciated how honest and blunt she was with me. The teacher did email back since, and said, Hi, this was something that I've done for at least a decade. It helped deal with behaviors in the past. I will not be doing it any longer. Thank you for your concern. Her response makes me think she thinks I'm the one that told admin, but oh well, what can you do? Something that came up in a lot of the comments was equating this to the clip charts. As many other users pointed out, googling these will bring up tons of articles on why these are problematic and shouldn't be used. The naughty nice lists have the added layer of directly labeling a child as naughty in front of their peers. Thanks again everyone. Edit to add, when my kid came home today, he told me, Santa took our list! Kinda makes it more weird in my opinion. He also questioned how Santa took the list because he said that it was displayed on their smart board. <laughs> we said he must have emailed himself a copy and then deleted it since it's private. I also asked if everybody made it on the nice list before Santa took it and he said they did and that he hopes no one moves lists now. In the comments, Lil Kilo says, I don't understand how so many of you aren't able to understand that the child's behavior can still be addressed. It just doesn't have to come with the shaming them in front of their peers. Some of you belong on the naughty list. OP says, Seriously, so many comments. OP's just mad that her kid's being held accountable. My kid was on the nice list. But in no way do I think he, or any of his classmates, shouldn't be corrected if misbehaving. I'm just not down with a teacher labeling a child naughty. I still remember being a tiny kid with autism and ADHD, getting my clip moved from green to yellow every day in the first grade for talking to other kids during centers. I was six. 
It did not change my behavior. It just made me feel bad that I couldn't control myself to do what my teachers wanted. I'm 28 now, and I still remember that feeling. Thank you for sticking up for the kids that weren't even yours. You may have helped those two more than you know. OP says, My son tells me often about one of the naughty kids getting in trouble. Makes me sad for her to actually get the naughty label. There is no way it's effective in helping her control herself. As far as I know, the other naughty kid is usually well behaved. Sad for him too. Goodness. This just drudged up a long buried memory from when I was in kindergarten like 25 years ago. Teacher always had one of those clip charts with green, yellow, and red zones. I was always in the green until my grandfather was diagnosed with terminal cancer and given days to live. The day after I overheard the news, I wasn't listening in class and got in trouble. Being sent to move my clip to the yellow zone was traumatizing emotionally for my little tot brain. Good for you and your friend for pushing back on this. Sometimes kiddos are going through tough things at home and don't need to also be worrying about whether they're on Santa's naughty list of all things. Effin Wright says, I spent pretty much all of kindergarten and first and second grade with red cards because I had undiagnosed ADHD. Even after being diagnosed, I was still the bad kid with the red card for three years. So in third grade, my teacher gave me talking sticks, five per day to ask questions, including whether I could go to the bathroom or get a drink. It did not go well. Things did not get better in fourth or fifth grade because of the reputation I had and teachers who believed children should be seen and not heard, which was still going strong in the early 2000s. In middle school, things got better. I got therapy, coping tools, and had separate spaces for testing to ensure that I was not a distraction and no one distracted me. Public shaming can do damage to a child's psyche, and it most definitely can do damage to how their teachers and educators perceive them. Naughty lists and colored cards need to be left in the past. The fastest way to get a child to behave badly is to tell them that they are bad. Absolutely effing terrible teaching, leading, and parenting. That one comment from the volunteer seriously made my blood boil. How dare they shame OP and criticize her for not listening to people educated in childhood development when the most widely accepted contemporary research on the area clearly suggests that OP was in the right. We have never been more aware of how deeply influential narratives in early childhood are. Do you want a kid to never respect rules or authority and spend their entire childhood making a circus of the classroom? Publicly shame them and brand them naughty. My husband and I's marriage counselor lied to us. My husband of seven months and I had a rough time after we got married when he came back from military deployments. Screaming matches, erectile dysfunction, resentment from deployment, me feeling sexually unattractive, etc. We went to a military-funded marriage counselor for about two months before the therapist suddenly disappeared, saying he was getting transferred. Said he'd continue seeing us once a week, but suddenly his phone number changed and we had no idea what happened. We just stopped counseling altogether due to the scheduling issues. Our last session was around February or so. I thought the marriage counseling helped, as we had been doing better, or so I thought. But apparently my husband is still unhappy, albeit for other reasons now. Our sex life still sucks, and I feel horribly unwanted and undesirable, despite being fit and attractive. We had a fight last night, and finally the substance of our individual counseling came out for the first time. We were shocked to say the least. So we had had both individual and couples counseling. We'd meet around once a week as a couple, and would alternate weeks individually. It came out last night. The counselor had been telling us individually that the problem was all the other's fault. He gave us both some of the same story, but with some differences. He told us each that the other was being very closed off and defensive, and not wanting to open up or discuss issues, that we were each blaming the other. This was while I was openly sharing with him my abandonment and anger issues and feeling insecure sexually, and providing him with background info from my previous therapy sessions with other counsellors. My husband claims that he would try to offer stories from his past as well, but that the counsellor would actually cut him off and say he wasn't the problem. 
He told my husband privately that I may have BPD and likely needed medication. This coincides chronologically with my husband out of nowhere yelling at me during arguments that I needed medication. I asked our counsellor if I should see a specialist after these fights, whether I really was showing these signs, and said honestly that I would get more intensive help if he thought that it would help our marriage. He laughed at my husband in individual sessions, saying there was nothing wrong with me, that my husband was deflecting by trying to diagnose me. Does he think he's a psychiatrist? He would laugh. He told me privately that my husband was emotionally and sexually underdeveloped and would never have a healthy relationship, sexually or emotionally, with anyone without serious change. That I should just move on, that he was not willing to change or admit to any issues and would run from all conflict. That each time the counsellor tried to broach issues, my husband would clam up and get defensive, that he didn't know what it truly meant to be married, and that he suspected there was something deeply rooted in my husband's past that was the root of all our problems, that my husband just needed more therapy. Note, we weren't paying for therapy, we got it for free due to military benefits. He told me that I was very smart and very attractive and deserved a partner more on my level. My husband reports the counsellor, told him there was nothing wrong with him, that he was very mature and intelligent, and all of our problems stemmed from my psychosis. The aftermath. I am horrified by how many of our fights after the beginning of counselling were coloured by his statements. I was treating my husband like a 13-year-old boy, and my husband kept telling me that I needed psychiatric help. Our marriage has actually improved much after this time, but I now believe that it's because I worked on my anger issues and gave my husband the benefit of the doubt, while my husband became a better communicator in arguments. My husband now has different issues with our marriage, but we are still both reeling from conversations about the counsellor last night and wondering what kind of harm it may have caused. I don't really know what I'm asking here. I had insomnia all night about this, and I just don't know what to do. Edit. Direct question. Should I report the counsellor? And what are suggestions for how to move forward with my husband in this? In the comments, Leet Dude says, I would report him to his boss. He set you up to fail and then ditched you guys. Sounds like you're off to a good start. I'm sorry that you had to experience that. I suggest that you continue working on the issues that you have. Perhaps you can try documenting your emotions, like writing down what you feel. At first, it'll not make much sense, but with time, you'll get a bigger picture. You can write what you feel and the experiences that you had in counselling and ask your husband to write what he felt and his experiences. Just writing down your experiences will make you feel better. I'm not sure about your legal options though, but for the moment, take one step at a time. At some point, it would be advisable to look for another counsellor. It may take time before you trust one, but counselling really does help you if you find the right person. By law, aren't therapists supposed to keep notes or recordings of each session? OP says, there were no notes. He explained that it was all kept confidential as per military policy. This made sense to me at the time because a lot of military veterans don't want documentation that might hurt their careers and such, so he explained it as a policy issue meant to encourage soldiers to attend counselling instead of just bottling it all up. Quotes, he told me I was very smart and attractive and deserved a partner more on my level. This is out of order, besides the other stuff. I bet he hasn't put that in his notes. Find another therapist and move onwards and upwards. My friend was a therapist in the military for a couple of years, and she's amazing at it. Most of them are great, some bad apples, but don't let that spoil it for you. Bullshit, bullshit, bullshit. My ex-husband and I went to couples counselling provided by the military through the military helpline. Anyways, you want to know how those counsellors got paid? By taking notes and faxing it to some kind of liaison. It was all confidential, and I doubt it was used for any kind of statistics type thing. It was mostly to ensure that you guys were talking and progress was being made, and that the counsellor isn't making you up so they can get free money. The military helpline wants to make sure people are actually getting help. That guy had to be taking notes, or at least forging notes saying that you were all butterflies and rainbows so he could get paid. I don't know if there's a person you could ask to get a copy of his notes or anything, Maybe the reason he dropped off the face of the earth is because he got caught by another couple and is facing investigation. 
I still think you should report him to whomever recommended him in the first place. He's basically scamming the military for money and ruining relationships. Update. So, this is an update more than three years later. A lot happened since then, and it occurred to me that maybe I should post an update in case anyone here was around for that. Summary. I was the wife who was seeing a marriage counsellor with my husband, both jointly and individually. Things were only getting worse and worse, and it was only after a blow-up fight that my husband and I compared notes and realised the counsellor had been feeding each of us lies. Counselor was telling me that my husband was emotionally 12 years old and would never be capable of a relationship, while reassuring my husband it was all well with him. Meanwhile, he was telling my husband that I had borderline personality disorder and needed medication. When my husband started accusing me of being mentally ill, I brought this up to the counselor who then began making fun of my husband for saying such a thing. Does he think he's a psychiatrist or something? And then he actually laughed. Counselor reassured me that I was a beautiful and intelligent woman and would do great once I left my husband. The counselor, who was provided by the military through their family services, ended up transferred a few weeks after we discovered this. We couldn't figure out if he got canned for abusing some other couple, if he retired, or some other shenanigans. Well, fast forward to today, my husband and I are doing great now. We went on vacation, both of us changed jobs, moved, and we are very happily married now four years later. We travel, adopted a couple of kitties, and bought a house in a place that we both love. How we got here. We both read some self-help books, started giving each other the benefit of the doubt, got better at communicating. I left my super high-stress job, he changed careers, and everything sort of did a 180. Funny enough, my old job had been killing me, and when I mentioned to the counsellor that I thought maybe I should find another job, since it was so dysfunctional, he protested against it. My husband and I did not report him at the time. We were concerned he would retaliate against my husband in some way, as my husband was in the armed forces for a year and a half after all this. I'm embarrassed that we didn't report him. We were scared and overwhelmed. I'm considering calling that base's family services now and filing an official report. I'm not sure if it'll matter. So much time has passed. That's... that's all, really. You were all such a great help then. I thought I might as well post this in case anyone around here remembered. In the comments, Sweetal says, This happened to my parents too. They found out what happened when my mum left her email open on the computer, and my dad saw what the counsellor had been saying. It turned out that he had done this with many more couples. Many of them divorced after never realising what happened. It turned out he was a textbook sociopath and just got off on the power of breaking couples up. Please consider reporting. This is likely not a one-time thing. He probably did it before and is doing it now. There will be possibly dozens or hundreds of couples carrying hurt, confusion, and children of those marriages who never get the resolution that you do. And OP replies, This is appalling. I had no idea this was even a dynamic. There are so many predators out there. I'm trying to find him and figure out where he's working. Also decided to call the base on Monday. Quotes, started giving each other the benefit of the doubt, got better at communicating. I mean, this right here would do so many people and couples good. It's so sad that you had to go through all of that to get there. Although I wonder, without some craziness, what else would get people to let go of their need to be right and to learn those lessons? OP says, it really would. The one good thing Dr. Lecter did was tell me, your husband said some stupid things in arguments. He doesn't actually mean to hurt you. This blew my mind because, as someone very good with words, I couldn't understand how someone could say such hurtful things without harboring malice. But I followed his advice and was much more patient when my husband would say something ridiculous. Also, finding a new job helped me a ton. I didn't recognize how much of a nervous wreck I was thanks to that godforsaken office. I became much more even-keeled overnight. This did wonders. I guess I just assumed that it was this way everywhere, but every IC and couples counselor that I've ever spoken to was adamant that they wouldn't cross over. If they were your IC, they were your IC, and would not become your couples counselor because it crossed a professional boundary and vice versa. Is that not typically the case? Yup, 
That's my understanding as well, although it sounds about right for the military to say they don't have the budget for multiple therapists to be available. I've worked in mental health for the past 15 or so years. To further my own personal resilience and understanding, I took an intro to counselling course, not with the purpose of being a counsellor, but to develop some insight in managing difficult conversations and whatnot. As part of the course, we had a session dedicated to unethical counsellors, where they discussed counsellors who were in the role for their own personal gratification. You could argue that we all are, but anyway, I digress. These unethical counsellors could include counsellors who have blurred their own boundaries, have saviour complexes, or those who purposely try to meddle and control their clients. They did reiterate that it's not everyone, and I think that it was more to get us to think about our reasons for being on the course, but it definitely opened my eyes. Our next post is by user illprofessional503, titled, Am I the asshole for avoiding my childhood friend after she called me a beggar for living in my ex-husband's house? My ex-husband Carter and I divorced almost four years ago. He divorced me. I was blindsided because I thought we had a very happy marriage. Unfortunately, this year I was in a hit and run and was hospitalized. My insurance didn't cover much and they never found who did it. I drained my savings, I couldn't live in my apartment anymore since I could no longer physically walk up five flights of stairs. I had a job but was let go. I was struggling and it was a low point in my life. Carter and I hadn't kept in touch, but he contacted me and said that I could live in one of his spare rooms. I had no other options. I offered to pay him rent, but he refused. He has a maid for chores, and I cook for him sometimes. It's okay. He's very chatty and bubbly, and if I close my eyes, I can pretend that we're friends again, and we never took the leap into a relationship and a divorce. My childhood friend Claire called me to express sympathies that I couldn't find a place. I told her that I was living with Carter. She insisted on coming over, as she also had been friends with him and had refused to take a side. When she arrived, Claire started to talk about how this was a bad situation. She asked me if I paid rent, and I told her no. She said that his pity would end, and asked if I wanted to be a beggar for the rest of my life. I told her I wasn't a beggar. She said she would tell our friends. I pleaded with her not to. Claire then said that if I didn't think what I was doing was wrong, I wouldn't have cared if she told everyone. I feel humiliated and ashamed. I have been avoiding her. She called me yesterday and said that I was being childish and emotionally manipulative for behaving that way. Am I the asshole? In the comments, RealisticHead4279 says, Not the asshole. Your friend, Claire, is a busybody and is sticking her nose into your business where she does not belong. Her words were cruel and judgmental and likely inaccurate. You need to limit your focus with her and not feel that you have to defend your choices to anyone except yourself. And OP says, I'm not trying to be a beggar. I've offered to pay. I would even do chores and clean, but he has a housekeeping service. He eats takeout often, but he hasn't turned down any dishes that I've offered him. That's the only way that I can thank him. Not the asshole. She is. Who died and put her in charge? What you do is none of her business. And OP says, Claire's always been very involved in what I do because she says that I don't make the right decisions like marrying Carter. She told me that it wouldn't work out because he'd get bored of me and she wasn't wrong. She's held that as proof that she knows better. If Claire is so concerned about you living with your ex, why isn't she offering to help you out? Instead of cutting you down and trying to make you think that this is a bad decision, she should be helping you. The only person being emotionally manipulative is Claire. In my honest opinion, if your friends are being judgmental about your situation and they aren't offering other options, then they really aren't very good friends. OP, don't worry about other people's opinions of your current situation that they can't possibly understand unless they've gone through a similar situation. Just take care of yourself, heal, and continue to do your best to appreciate your ex for his generosity. P.S. You are not a beggar. You're a human in a difficult situation, and someone that actually cares about you offered to help you in your time of need. OP replies, she believes in everyone working hard for themselves and then not asking for handouts. She said she could help me look for apartments or pass along my request for an apartment at ground level, but that's the extent of help. I've tried to show my appreciation for Carter and he is happy to hear it. 
He told me that I can stay for as long as I'd like, or forever, but I can't wait to save up and find an apartment that I can live in. He is too close and affectionate with me. There's part of me that still loves him, and he keeps poking those parts of my heart. So let me get this straight. Claire, whose family has money and is married to a wealthy man, has the nerve to think that other people should work hard for themselves and not ask for handouts? What a hypocrite! And Claire is not your friend! Friends do not kick a friend when they get hit by a car and are doing their best to pick themselves up and move on with their life. OP says, Claire is privileged in many ways, but she's also very intelligent. I think it makes her believe that she would be successful regardless of what happened. But I'm also smart, and life dealt me a bad hand. I did the best I could. I lived frugally, and saved money, and followed all the rules, and yet all my hard work has been wiped out. I can't try harder out of my situation. I can only try my best. Update. So a couple of days after my post, Claire reached out and apologized for using harsh words. I accepted her apology, but things were still uncomfortable for me. She said she found an apartment I could live in. It was on the first floor and had access to public transportation. The rent was high, but not out of my budget. I would be living with three other people in the apartment. I checked it out and it was acceptable. I told Carter that Claire had found an apartment for me and he flipped out. He said I couldn't live there because it was a dangerous part of town. We discussed it and then came to a compromise. He would feel better if we went out to a hotel in the area for a few days to see how dangerous it was. It was fine for the first few days, but one morning a man followed me. It was frightening. Carter said that it was proof that the area wasn't safe. I told him this was the only option I had for now, unless I wanted to go back to my parents' house and find a new job there, or sleep on friends' couches. My parents live in a developed country and I don't speak the language well, so that is my absolute last resort. Carter reminded me that he said that I could stay as long as I liked. I told him that I didn't want to be a burden on him anymore. It was very kind of him to offer, but I can't take advantage of his kindness indefinitely. He said Claire was putting thoughts in my head. I offered to pay him rent again, and he finally agreed, but he deliberately wastes the rent money on silly things to prove a point. I told him that, but he said that if I didn't like it, I could stop paying or pay him in another way, and I dropped the conversation. Claire asked me why I hadn't moved into the apartment. I said I was paying rent to Carter, and then she chewed me out. Claire and Carter's social circles overlap, so Carter found out about how Claire was saying that I chose to stay there even when she found me a new place to live. He got into an argument with me and said that I should stop talking to Claire. He made an ultimatum of him or Claire, and I chose him. Since then, he's been very happy. I'm happy to see how cheerful he is, but I can't handle the constant hugs or snuggles or pinching. It makes me feel bad and dredges up bad thoughts. I feel inadequate and crushed because he may be able to be platonic friends with me, but I still haven't gotten past the hurt. On a positive note, I started physical therapy and signed up for a free counseling program through my work. I have a tiny budget, so I have to make do. Now in the comments. Okay, reading all the posts and your comments, are you sure Carter doesn't regret the divorce and is harboring romantic feelings for you, especially since you could have died? Also, Claire is completely into Carter and doesn't like that he cares about you. She may not want him, but she doesn't want him to want you, especially if she can't have him. Quotes, I'm happy to see how cheerful he is, but I can't handle the constant hugs or snuggles or pinching. Nothing here sounds healthy, honestly. Yup, OP is between the devil and the deep blue sea. What Carter is doing for you, not even many friends would do. I think he still has a thing for you. Claire is not your friend. She is indeed jealous of you, no matter how many good things she has going for her. The one thing she wants the most, you have it. Yup, she is jealous, even if OP thinks she can't be. Perhaps she feels it's unfair that OP gets to stay in a nice house rent-free. Perhaps she thinks it's unfair that despite her beauty, etc., she never got to live in a nice house rent-free. Perhaps her husband is mean to her, and she's jealous that OP's ex is kind to her. Who knows exactly, but yeah, she's jealous. Yeah, this doesn't sound platonic. 
It sounds like he wants to get back together in some way, and that Claire had her sights set on him. I agree. I have a feeling that things are going to get very messy very soon. Oh, for sure. I don't know why she would care about OP living with her ex-husband while she recovers. Like, if the situation works for them, why would she care? Why spread it all around to all her friends that OP is a beggar? They both need to tell her off and cut her out. My husband doesn't want to have intimacy with me unless it is to conceive kids. Sorry, English isn't my first language. I, female 26, have recently got married to my husband, Edward, male 26, two months ago. We both attended the same church ever since we were born, and I started to like him over the years. At 20, we started gradually talking to each other and got engaged at 24. My husband is very religious and never misses a service. I too am religious, but not as much as him. We both respect the other's choice, and it's not really an issue between us. However, when we were dating and engaged, he didn't come near me in any way. For example, we rarely held hands, and he never hugged nor kissed me on the cheeks, even though it's a form of greetings that are very used in our culture. It bothered me a bit, but I think that he was doing it out of respect. The roller coaster was our wedding night. During the ceremony, we danced for the first time, we held hands, and we got to our hotel. We hugged, and he kissed me for the first time on my lips. It wasn't like making out or anything, just a peck. That's it. Nothing else. We didn't do anything more. Not even cuddle. We just showered and went to sleep because we were extremely exhausted. Right when I was about to fall asleep when we were talking, he told me that he won't do anything unless it is to conceive kids. I wasn't sure of what to say, so I just remained silent and dozed off. This literally crushed my expectations. Of course, I understand that he doesn't want to do anything, but really? Not until we decide to have kids, which is minimum two years away. I love my husband with all of my heart, and I would never leave him as he is the best and most respectful human being I've ever met, and an amazing person overall. But I can't seem to accept this. Ever since I was a teen, I've been addicted to Wattpad and spicy stories. So of course, I have always dreamt of my wedding night. I didn't really want to keep my expectations really high, because I knew that it would most likely not come to reality. But I never thought that this would happen. I was disappointed for the rest of our honeymoon, which lasted a week. I know it's my fault for not talking to him about it, but I was really afraid of doing so. You see, in our culture, it's not appropriate for a woman to talk about these things, nor initiate intimacy. Plus, Edward is religious, like I said, so I was afraid of him judging me if I did anything that he could consider unholy or whatever. I even tried to seduce him for the past couple of months, but he wouldn't look at me. Not in a mean way, but he would just laugh it off and give me a peck or something like that. It really started to bug me because I have a somewhat high drive and really want to do things with him. I can't help it. I don't really know what the reason is behind this, and I don't know how to address the subject with him. Once more, I will not even consider leaving him. So please, all advice will be appreciated. In the comments, Emotional Agony 29 says, He didn't even give you a choice to consider if you still wanted to marry him? I mean, did you know that he wouldn't have sex with you unless it was to conceive kids? Or he dropped that bomb on your wedding day after you married him? Annulment, OP. He's not the one for you. He hasn't given you the choice. Dude didn't even hold her hand before the wedding day. Damn repressive culture made her completely unprepared. I'm surprised she didn't see this as a red flag, after all the Wattpad romances she's read though. Romance writers do tend to skew feminist. Yeah, I gotta agree. I'm surprised too. Four years of not holding her hands, no hugs, and even no kisses on the cheek. I can't even. I have a suspicion about the reasons. Him growing up in an extremely religious surrounding and not even wanting to hold hands, generally not being interested. Maybe he's gay? Sweetie, you need to talk to whoever does couples counseling at your church and tell them the marriage isn't consummated. This isn't you having a high drive or being inappropriate as a woman. There is a real problem here. You need an annulment. Your marriage isn't legal. This 
She says she doesn't want to leave him, but for most churches, it is needed to consummate the marriage, i.e. have sex to be considered as married. She may be married legally, but she's not married to him religiously, if they're from this type of church. I think even legally it's not a marriage until it's consummated. You can legally get it annulled for that reason. I agree. He's most likely gay. I'm so sorry. Update. So, after posting yesterday, I was literally bombarded by hundreds of comments suggesting that Edward might be a homosexual and using me to cover up his sexuality. I wasn't ready at all for such a possibility, and it had never actually crossed my mind. Compared to other people from our community, we are one of the few who aren't homophobic, and we previously discussed our sexualities before. I don't want to really get into this topic, but Edward was really honest with me at that time that he is straight, and that he can't just picture himself being homosexual, religious or not. Besides, we both have online jobs, so we're literally together the whole time, and have mutual friends, so I would quickly have noticed any suspicious behaviour. Today, I decided to confront him like many of you suggested. I had been repeating continuously my script in my head, and went for it. We were both chilling after having lunch, so I asked him if he wanted to talk about sex and intimacy. He said yes, and was curious about what was bothering me. I was direct and simply asked him why he won't do anything with me unless it's for kids. Edward got genuinely surprised and confused by my question. At that moment, I just wanted to disappear from this universe and evaporate. Because of my embarrassment, I'm not physically able to recall how the conversation went exactly, but it turned out that he thought that it wasn't normal to feel aroused around me, nor to have sex, unless for procreation. I felt really bad for him. Apparently that's what he grew up thinking, and that's what his friends and environment he grew up abused him into believing. I cannot imagine that they did this to him. I'm sure it was to make fun of him and mess around, which led to completely messing up his view on sexual matters and desires. And, there is no way that they also believe in this themselves. This conversation went on for a couple of hours. I realized that it must have been very hard on him to talk about this specific topic, so we had a rest from this subject and took a nap. After that nap, he apologized for not talking about this with me beforehand. We discussed many other things, and the fact that he never displayed any affection before our wedding was due to his beliefs. And don't worry, we also talked about our wedding night, but basically, he got aroused every time he came near me, so he felt extremely ashamed of showing it or acting on it, and thought that I was just teasing him. He also didn't want to do something that could be considered bad, according to what they fed his mind with. Not gonna lie, I expressed to him my resentment and the way that he never asked for my opinion on this matter. He apologized again, and said that he was afraid of what my reaction would be if he expressed himself. We tried to sorta of sort things out, and we promised to start working on physical touch. Edward said that he would never do anything that could make me feel down ever again, and that he will always be ready to answer all of my questions. This realization was really like a slap across the face for him, so I suggested going to therapy. He immediately agreed, and starting tomorrow we will look for a therapist. Going on Reddit wasn't really the best idea, but it really gave me a push. Having this conversation was definitely something that we should have done sooner, way back when we were engaged. Also, to everyone telling me to leave, just because the problem was about intimacy doesn't mean that I would leave him. Of course, if this took another turn, and if I found out that he was cheating on me or lying, I would have immediately divorced him without looking back. I know that intimacy is very important to couples and healthy relationships, but if Edward is not comfortable and has issues with this matter, I have no choice but to understand him. He has always been there for me and always showed me his love and support, just not throughout physical ways. So the least I could do is understanding him and respecting his boundaries. Until we talk everything out, I will not pressure him into doing anything and would rather do it step by step. In the end, we cried together and laughed about ourselves. Then he made us some snacks that we had while watching our favorite TV series. Now Edward is sleeping right next to me, closer than usual. I feel happy about it, even though it's not much, but I definitely consider this an improvement. I also feel much more better than yesterday. There are still many things that we need to discuss, and so many more steps to take. 
I think I might update our situation later on, but right now I would like to thank all the kind comments and nice people who tried to reach out and cheer me up. So yeah. Update 2 so, like I mentioned in my last update, we started looking for therapists and found some sort of center a couple of days later. Basically, they're like a group of therapists specialized in different types of issues. So once we explained to them our situation, they assigned us to a couples therapist. She was actually very understanding of our situation, and we have had a few sessions with her which are very eye-opening. She navigated us through our emotions, and basically was more like a consultant than a therapist. As for my husband, he was assigned to another therapist and has sessions with him twice a week. It's not just because of our issue, but they found out that my husband has some deep childhood traumas that they need to work on. This journey will take him a couple of months apparently, and this is something that he definitely needs, so he's totally ready for it. As for our intimate life, our therapist advise us to show each other more affection before taking things slowly and watching educational videos as references. So for a week, we tried showering each other with random hugs, kisses, and cuddles, and this was really addicting. For Edward, it was really something new, but now he won't stop with the back hugs, and it's very comforting. Then, I started teasing him to take things to another level, like the therapist said, since Edward is still trying to build up the courage to do so. After a while, we made out for the first time. It felt super great, and from there, we started getting touchy. We did this for like two weeks and got freakier each day. The videos were really helpful. We also took our first shower together and played around. All these little achievements really made me so happy. And for the big thing, we finally made love two days ago. It was very great, and we took it slowly, but we both really enjoyed it. It felt like a different level of closeness, and I'm very proud of my husband for finally taking this step without feeling bad or guilty about it. Not only that, but we also went on some dates as a change of routine and tried new restaurants, which I really love. Edward surprised me with my dream restaurant, and we had a blast. Our communication is 10 times better than before, and it really feels like the wall that was standing between us is completely gone. There are still many things that we haven't tried, so we're really excited. I also told him about my smut obsession yesterday, and he asked me to give him a list of fanfics that I really like so that he could make them happen in real life. That was really so awesome! I still can't get over this! And lastly, since our honeymoon wasn't really a honeymoon, we're thinking of going on one this Christmas maybe, so I can't wait. By the way, to all the comments that suggested using toys, we talked about it, but the therapist said that this could be too early and that Edward might get addicted to it if we use them during our firsts, so I guess we will wait. Thank you everyone for all the kind messages I received. I don't think that there is anything else left to update, so thanks for sticking with me. In the comments, addicted to back hugs, got freakier each day, and a smut obsession. How good is blossoming young love? Great to hear that it's all working out. Honestly, it's pretty impressive that OP is able to manage and handle this whole situation pretty well. I'm glad nothing terribly dramatic or insane happens. This shows that communication is important. It's nice to read a story where things go smoothly without drama. Religious trauma can really impact people poorly, and it's really unfortunate. I wish the two of them the best, and hope that they're able to continue on. I know, right? Poor guy was just aroused and had been told that it's basically a sin for a normal body function. I'm glad therapy is helping them as a couple. I think it normally happens more with girls, but this isn't rare. Lots of religions put a huge emphasis on virginity and push girls to base their whole lives around how virginal they are. Then on their wedding night, they're expected to be 500% down to pound. It seems obvious in retrospect, but when you raise a child to base their whole lives and personality around something like their virginity, what are they supposed to be when they throw it away? It's like banning a 20-year veteran workaholic from their career field. They don't know how to be anything except their job, and now they don't have that anymore. This poor guy. Imagine feeling ashamed because you are, checks notes, attracted to your wife. Poor dude is about to find a whole world of cuddly, snuggly fun. Our next post is by user Castro Was Right, titled 
Am I the asshole for telling my 26 male girlfriend that she 25 female needed to apologize to my friend 25 female after she went off on her on a trip? This weekend, I took a little friend vacation with my close friend group. A few of them invited their significant others, and I've been dating my girlfriend for a long enough time now that I don't think it would be awkward to bring her along. So my girlfriend gets along with all my friends very well, excluding one. My friend Jessica is a very nice girl, and in a lot of ways is very similar to my girlfriend. I think this is just one of the cases where people who are similar just repel because on paper they should be very good friends. They aren't outwardly rude to each other, however, it's clear that they just don't vibe. So three things happened on this trip that led to disaster. One, on our first day there, we planned on going to the beach. While we were getting ready, my girlfriend realized and told me that she was feeling bloated and she forgot to pack a one piece to wear. I told her we could just chill in the room and she said she wanted to go down to the beach, but we should go buy one at the resort shop. On our way down, we ran into Jessica and I told her that we were going down to the shop to look for a new bathing suit. Jess then offered to let my girlfriend borrow one of hers. My girlfriend immediately rejected and said we would buy one. Two, we were at a bar drinking and dancing. Jess is only like 5'5 five five and probably less than 130 pounds. She's also pretty much skin and bones, so she's a lightweight. Eventually, she got pretty lit and was finding everyone and trying to get us to take a shot. When she got to us, I was down, but my girlfriend wasn't. I told her it'd be fun, but she said no, and Jess said we were being boring. So I just took a shot with Jess, and this set her off. 3. The final issue was that the next day my girlfriend and I were late for breakfast because we were getting intimate and lost track of time, which was wrong of us. So apparently, Jess said she'd come get us, and as she walked past our door, she heard zoo noises, and then she went back down to everyone else and said that we were occupying each other's time and may be a minute. When we got downstairs, the group was cracking jokes, which I thought was no big deal. Then they said that Jess had heard us, which got my girlfriend mad. This was apparently the straw that broke the camel's back. My girlfriend snapped on her and told her that Jess has been catty to her all trip, and she's just been trying to have a good time. She told her to stop being such a pick me bit to her, and this caused Jess to cry. I told my girlfriend she needed to apologize to her and resolve whatever beef they have. My girlfriend said that Jess needs to apologize to her for acting like she did and that I'm being a dick for taking her side. We've been fighting about this since we got back, and things are now awkward with Jess. My friends are split on this, as some think that my girlfriend was being overboard, while some think that she may have had a point, which I don't understand. Am I the asshole? OP has offered the following explanation for why they think they might be the asshole. I could be the asshole, obviously, because taking Jessica's side does sort of make it seem like I'm prioritizing her. If this is the case, I'm also a huge asshole for missing the signs of cattiness that came before. In the comments, Fairmount1955 says, You're the asshole. I gotta say, I don't get why you think your girlfriend was the sole issue and owes Jess an apology. It seems like you're looking for blame. 1. Not everyone's comfortable borrowing a bathing suit from someone. I've heard people say it's similar to wearing someone else's underwear, so there is an ick factor. 2. She's entitled to not be pressured to do a shot. Not everyone thinks it's fun. And drunk people pressuring others to do shots is boring. 3. She heard zoo noises, and then she went back down to everyone else and said that we were occupying each other. That is gross of Jess. Girlfriend's reaction may have been more intense than necessary, but I don't agree that Jess wasn't problematic. Not being comfortable wearing someone else's bathing suit doesn't mean that the other person is in the wrong for offering. Correct, but the fact that OP mentioned it implies he thinks there was something wrong with his girlfriend saying no to the offer. Incorrect. He brought it up because girlfriend accused Jess of having an attitude all weekend, and one of the examples of Jess being so horrible to her is that she offered to let her borrow a swimsuit. To be fair, this isn't necessarily true. It's an example that OP chose, not an example that the girlfriend gave. She could be talking about other things that OP didn't pick up on and may have zero issue with Jess offering her the swimsuit. Mobile Prune says, With the exception of the first issue, which isn't an issue at all, it's not unreasonable for your girlfriend not to want to borrow someone else's suit, Jess actually sounds like the problem to me. 
so you're the asshole. When it comes to certain things like drinking and intimacy, you need to have a certain level of respect and tact, and it sounds like Jess has none. You don't call people boring because they don't want to drink, and you don't go around telling everyone that you heard your friends having sex. This isn't a TV series where things like that are funny. Back up to the post, we have an edit. Okay, I get it. I'm going to apologize to my girlfriend and tell her that I was wrong to defend Jess and that I'm going to talk to Jess and make sure she doesn't ever speak to her like that again. Update. So I'm back. I know everyone hates me, but I was asked for an update, so here we are. I just want to say everyone was right. I was an asshole. I was being a pushover. I was being a shit boyfriend and partner. I did prioritize Jess over my girlfriend's feelings, and that was so shitty of me. My girlfriend and I are currently on a break. I tried to apologize to her and make sure she understood that I knew how wrong I was. I told her that I was sorry for letting Jess disrespect her and be catty, and that I'd never let that happen again. My girlfriend said that Jess has been like this to her since we started dating, and said that I've just been either ignoring it or unable to see it. Through a tearful back and forth, my girlfriend told me that she wouldn't let herself feel second to Jess. She said when I figure out what's going on there with Jess and I, then talk to her. But until then, she wants to get some distance from our relationship. So that evening I was heartbroken, but I wanted to still make it clear to Jess that she would not be disrespectful to my girlfriend if we got back together and that she owes her an apology no matter what. I thought it would be better to have this as a face-to-face -face conversation as there is a lot of ambiguity over text, so I went to her place. She apologized to me and said that she would call my ex to apologize to her. I got home in the morning, and I just spent a lot of time reflecting on the bad decisions I'd made, and how much I hurt my girlfriend, and how right everyone who said I was being a shitty boyfriend was. So, I'll admit it. I effed up. I didn't protect the person I was supposed to protect. I was too blind to see Jess being catty and mean to her. If she takes me back, that won't ever happen again. In the comments, Proof Street says, You slept with Jess, didn't you? You said you went to her house and came back home in the morning. This is exactly what your girlfriend was talking about. Now you two are most definitely not getting back together. If you have feelings for Jess, you need to be honest with your girlfriend and end the relationship. It's not fair to either your girlfriend or Jess. Just tell her the truth. You can't have them both, OP. Your girlfriend deserves a better partner. Also, after reading your comments about how Jess is tempting, I'm starting to think that you always had feelings for Jess and only started dating your girlfriend to make her jealous or to get over her. Jess is too tempting. Sir? Please be for effing real. That is exactly what he did. He was blind to Jess being catty because he has hots for her and got mad at his ex for not buying his BS story that they're just friends and Jess can do no wrong. Now he figured they're on a break, so it's fine to go bang the pick-me girl, but his ex will definitely figure it out if she gives him another chance. Although hopefully she won't get back with him in the first place. OP says, Who says we had sex? Maybe she was just there when I cried. You're not denying that you had sex. So just be a man and admit that your ex-girlfriend was right to dump you, and you care more about your friend than anyone else. OP says, I don't care more about Jess. I just thought that if we did it once, it would get rid of whatever sexual tension was between us and we'd be able to move on. But now we both want to keep doing it, even though we both know we shouldn't, which is why I said I can't have her in my life if I want my girlfriend back. When asked why he doesn't just date Jess, OP says, Our feelings for each other are just complicated and I know immediately getting into a relationship with Jess would destroy my ex. OP? The moment you screwed Jess, you ended any possibility of getting back together with your ex. Nail in the coffin. I think you need therapy. I, 25 male, went to serve in the military for one month and came back to find my girlfriend, 24 female, had changed. Hello Reddit. My girlfriend and I have been dating for two years. I was planning to propose in the next three months, and I was extremely sure that she was going to say yes, as we've been planning our lives together. She was hinting that I should propose by sending me cheeky proposal posts, signaling that she wants an engagement ring on her finger, 
and she sometimes would say, when we get married, yada yada yada. We live together. Admittedly, we started fast and we rushed into things. We started living together a month into our relationship. We have been living together ever since. She was always so loving with me. This is the best relationship I've ever had. She always made me feel loved, cared for, and even if she's somewhat selfish by nature, she always puts me first. And she loves me very much, and I love her very much. I have been the perfect boyfriend. I keep on taking her on dates, giving her gifts, helping her around the house, solving her problems, and giving her affection and care. We never fought, not even once. But then, things changed. I had to go and serve in the military for a month. She dropped me off to the bus station, kissed me, hugged me, cried, said that she loves me and would miss me a lot, etc. While I was in the military, she sent me texts saying how much she misses me and she called me frequently, speaking in a loving manner. After about four days though, this stopped. During the month we barely spoke and only when I called. She'd only sent me around 20 texts. When I came back, she came to welcome me. She was very distant. She didn't even seem happy that I was back. Everything felt off about her. We went back to our home and I asked what was wrong and why she was acting this way. We spoke about it for hours and she said that during my absence, she realized that she had too much love and wanted to cool off a bit. She said we rushed into things and she wants me to move out as she was not ready for this kind of life where we live together. She said that she wanted to live a little and not do everything together. She wanted to go on dates with me and experience the things we haven't experienced because we immediately moved in together. She wants to go out and have fun on her own too, and she wants the space for herself. She's studying medicine and she's in her last year and wants to focus more on that too. I said okay, I'll move out, but I don't feel like this explains her being so distant. I asked if there was somebody else and she said no. She said that she only wants to live her life like a 24 year old and not like a 30 year old. I don't keep her from dressing the way she wants or I don't get jealous when she goes out with friends, but I understand that me being there 24 seven can make her feel burnt out. She said she loves me and wants to keep working on the relationship and everything will be better for us this way. But I feel kind of icky about this. I feel like our relationship is dying. Everything changed so fast and she doesn't even say I love you back when I say it. I feel like there's a distance between us all the time. I got a house and I'm moving out tomorrow. I cancelled my plans to propose and I'm ready to take it slow like she wants to. I feel like this can break us though. Can our relationship survive this? Why can this happen? What's the outlook? For some context, OP lives in Turkey, normally military service is 6 months, but there's a law passed in 2019 that allowed for 1 month service with a payment of around 1130 USD. In the comments, Lying Tattooist says, Whether there's someone else or not, she's making it clear that she doesn't want to be with you. She's trying to be nice about it by saying you can all still work on it. Take the hints, move out and move on. It sucks for a two-year relationship to end, but life goes on and I promise you will meet someone else even better at some point. It's better to end things in two years instead of being in an unhappy relationship for ten years. The thing I've never liked about doing it that way is it's not a nice way to go about it. It really comes across as they're leading you on, when although you don't have to be blunt about it, you could be upfront and just say it without ambiguity. You went away and she got a taste of life on her own and liked it. It doesn't have to be something sinister with someone else, it could just as easily be this. I don't think she liked it, she probably found it really hard to be alone and realized she'd lost some of her previous independence. In a couple, you often hand off tasks to your significant other and once they're gone, you'll find out that you have no idea how to pick a good TV show, do laundry, pay your bills, fix the car. She wants to reclaim her life, her independence. It's something the media tells us that we must be, strong independent women and men. In reality, we live in an interdependent world and she needs to accept that that is okay. Update. First of all, thank you for your thoughtful comments. It meant a lot to me to see you coming to my support and providing valuable insights. 
She said, I love you, unprompted the evening of the day that I made this post. I thought this was a good sign and started up a conversation about our relationship. It was a really good talk. She was honest and I could feel it. I'll be honest with you too. To address the obvious thought that everyone had, I thought she could have cheated as well, but nothing like that happened. She's made it clear that she didn't cheat in a respectable, clear way and tone, and I'm convinced that she didn't. I trust this without any doubts now. Although all those comments about Jody made me laugh, I needed a good laugh. This being a soft breakup was my other concern. I asked her if she considered breaking up with me, and she said the thought came into her mind, but she didn't want to, as she loves me and was sure that she would love the future that we will have. She didn't want a life without me. I asked if me moving out will eventually lead to a breakup, and she said she doesn't think it will, that she thinks it'll only make us stronger. The problem was, as it turns out, that I went from being a happy person to someone who was worrying and depressed. She only realized that this was the case when I was gone, and I wasn't around to spread negativity anymore. She said that she fell in love with me because I was happy and eccentric. She mentioned that yes, while I was doing things that a good boyfriend would do, she felt that I was only doing them out of duty and that I used to be very excited about buying her flowers. But lately when I came home with flowers, I didn't celebrate this small occasion with her. I just gave them to her and then went to bed. I admit, I have been very sulky the past few months. I was always worrying about my career, finances, and not being able to accomplish my future goals. I'd already realized this while I was serving and worked through it myself. I think I'm in a better place now and she says she saw that I am. Her solution to this was me moving out. My negative energy, and I wasn't aware it was so contagious, wouldn't affect her anymore. Because it did. And she already has a lot to worry about. She needs a positive attitude to stay strong and I was making that harder. She also realized that we were too codependent and too much in a routine. She thought me moving out would solve this also. I agree. We both were very independent people at the start, but then we got lost in love. I was always waiting for her to come home, and she was always waiting for me to do anything. This ordeal made life somehow stale. She realized that because I did so much for her, she became heavily dependent on me to solve her problems, making her feel weak and incapable. Because of this reliance, she even had a hard time paying the bills, and this got to her. She missed her old self, the one with confidence and power. I realized that I lost myself too. I was a social person who commonly took the initiative to do something, with a lot of flash and crash in my life. I lost that. I lost friends, and I lost my active lifestyle. She wants to go out with friends and not include me in everything. She wants to not worry about the things she says while with friends because I might be uncomfortable with it. She wants to sometimes take long walks alone. She doesn't want to ask me every time she wants to buy something. She doesn't want to feel guilty when her day-to-day -day plans don't include me. A problem that some of you may have big issues with. She admitted that she received flirtatious male attention when doing her internship at school. I wasn't surprised as she is very good looking and with a very feminine personality to boot. She says she would never cheat on me and didn't want to respond to anything, never considered anyone else but me in her life, but she liked it. She enjoyed the ego boost and that made her feel guilty. Guilty that she could like such a thing while I was facing hardship. I said it was normal to like attention from the opposite sex, especially when you're lonely. I appreciate that she immediately tried to shut down advances and stayed committed and loyal to me. I don't think this will be a problem, and she looked very relieved when I thought that it wasn't a big deal. In the end, she said that she missed the old me, the one that was happy and excited about the little things. She said she loves me very much, and she's ready to continue the relationship we had before if I could get away from my sulky self finally. She tried to make me happy, but I was feeling bad for too long. Me regaining myself meant us regaining the amazing relationship we had. Us shedding away our codependence meant us having a stronger, more stable future when nothing like this happens again. After the talk, everything changed for the better. She looked so relieved, and I gave her my word that I will not try to fall into this situation again. 
She hugged and kissed me and gave me a gift that she bought for me while I was away. I then took her out to a nice place to drink and celebrate afterwards. I felt happy and unencumbered for the first time in a long time. We had an amazing time and discussed many things. We came back home to have the most intimate and amazing sex we had had since the beginning of our relationship and stayed up all night cuddling and listening to music. So, things are looking good for us right now. I thank all of you again for your support, and especially the longer messages that were speaking from experience really helped me. I am very happy that we got over this, and I'm very excited about the future. Thanks again, Reddit. In the comments, xdem112 says, Not at all the positive update that you seem to think it is. So you've been going through a slightly tough time, and you are no longer 100% outgoing or positive. So she wants independence that she could so easily incredibly curate for herself while being in a relationship. So she ignored you for an entire month without one single prior discussion about her feelings. That doesn't bode well at all for a life with this person. Life is gnarly. It throws some nasty curveballs, and she has proved that she is not mentally prepared to support a romantic partner through the tough times at this point. You are far too trusting, and she is out of touch with herself at best. You don't move out your long-term partner, enjoy the intention of others, and admit that you want to hang out with friends without thinking about what you're saying, i.e. respecting your partner because you want to work on your relationship. You both are just drawing out your breakup pretty clearly. She just wants to be single. I just hope that she has the integrity to end things if she comes to that realization herself instead of jerking you around or becoming manipulative. This really bothers me. I'm glad you both worked it out, but I hate the way that she treated you. Instead of talking to you, she became cold and distant. That's awful. Instead of being there to support your emotional issues about your concerns of your life, she asked you to move out. That's awful. Instead of just saying, let's hang out without each other and with our own respective friends, she asked you to move out. The better solution is to just do those things that she is bothered by. There is no reason that she can't go out with her friends without you. There is no reason she can't just pay a bill. Reading this made me think that the thing you both need is couples therapy. Maybe even individual therapy could be good for you both. OP replies, maybe if it comes to that, I'll be open to therapy. I know her solution sucks and there are other ways to go by solving this, but will it comfort her the same? She wants this and this is the solution she thinks will work. If this doesn't work, I have no blame. If I insist on another solution and it doesn't work, she'll be thinking, well maybe if we tried my solution… I'm playing ball. Worst case scenario, I'll already have a house to go back to. Most importantly, these are her wishes and I respect them. If one day my wishes arise, she will respect them too. You're right in your way of thinking, and I'll not forget the way that she became distant during my time in the military, but I've already forgiven her. Our relationship was more than this ordeal, and she has been more than supportive in the past. I can see how it's not positive, but at the moment, I think I'll ride this. I'll be prepared if it doesn't seem to work out, but currently we're okay and I love her, that is reason enough. People are saying that she'll cheat on me and she wants to live the single life, but I don't think so. I was supposed to move out today, but she asked me to stay. Of course, you're right, she didn't support me during a time where I needed support the most, but I can see her perspective. When I did go through a tough time, she was with me. She did support me then. She really made an effort, which is why I can understand she could be tired of the whole thing when I was away. If we do break up, that's fine. I'm a young man, and I can handle some heartbreak if it comes my way in the future. No reason to abandon someone you love just to avoid that. If we don't, that's amazing. But I want to work on this, and as long as she does too, hopefully we'll end up building a better relationship for the both of us. I don't get why you're getting downvoted for this. It's a mature way of looking at the situation. Literally all relationships are a kind of work and maintenance, and it only falls through if one of you stops doing the work. If you don't want to be the one stopping the work and ending it, that's your choice. You can't control other people, so they might stop doing the work down the road, just like anyone, and it sounds like you understand that. Kudos. And OP says, 
It's because I didn't just break up, and I decided to try to stay and fix things at my expense if necessary. It's a commendable notion that I would think, but apparently people don't like it. Thanks for your input. Man, Reddit needs to get off its one narrative train. It's super easy to slot this into place, but it's not exactly helping the OP. The actual situation is described. Guy has been getting more down over time, relationship was getting a bit codependent. Girlfriend didn't realize this until he was away, thought they should take a step back since they moved in together after a month. He feels worried because she withdrew while he was doing military training, which he had no choice in. Understandable. Meanwhile, she's starting something incredibly stressful at the same time, has had a patient die, wants to get a fresh start with their relationship since they rushed it in the beginning. This is a very realistic scenario, and yeah, being that they're so young and struggling a bit, they might break up. That might be because people being attracted to her makes her realize it's not working anymore. That's fine, although sad. Luckily, he's being much more level-headed than Reddit, so that's a good sign for weathering this. Yeah, that's kind of why I didn't comment on this one. I do realize on that first post I did miss quite a few comments that could have given more context to the whole situation. My apologies, but from what I'm reading here, she was doing medical training, and she had a patient die on her while she was doing said medical training. That definitely is not good for your mental health, and I didn't really want to comment on it because I feel like I didn't have a lot of enough information from that first story. That's just a mess for me to deal with. And yeah, if it works, it works. If it doesn't work, it doesn't work. That's just the reality of relationships in this day and age, in life. I say good luck to you, OP, and that I'm rooting for you. That's for sure. I, I really hope things work out for you. Our next post is by user roundmacaron190, titled, I'm leaving my family. I'm typing this in a mix of fear and nerves. I'm the youngest, 22, of five kids, male 30, male 28, female 28 twins, and female 25. My parents are heavily religious and we live in Utah. Growing up, everything had to be done perfectly. It didn't matter if it was grades, looks, social activities, or even friends. I'm different from my siblings as I was never interested in the maths and science like they were. I've always been the writer, the painter. I remember once when I was 13, I made a painting of a dove in a snowy field and won first in the competition. I told my parents who got angry that I had wasted my time with something so worthless when I should have been using the time to study. I still had A's in every class. My mother won't even say more than a few words to me. She always seems like she hates me, and I just don't understand. My father burned the painting to remind me of what was truly important before taking all of my art supplies until I showed some more responsibility with my time. It's been like this for as long as I can remember. I work full time and have since I was 15 at McDonald's, dashing every bit of money that I could. My father took half my checks as tithing to help teach me what being an adult was like. I applied to several colleges, but was told by my parents that they would not be helping me with tuition as they did for my siblings because they thought that sending me to college would just be a waste of money. Just saying, remember what happened last time when we didn't send a particular man to art school? Just putting that one out there, guys. So I got angry. I am so tired of being the black sheep just because I like the arts more than maths and science. And then, I heard them talking when I got up in the middle of the night about the perfect man they'd found who was willing to take me in. Through our church. I'm terrified, and so I'm leaving. I've got some money saved up, a good amount, and I'm leaving the country. I found a job that lets me work remote doing freelance design work, and I've had my passport since I was a kid because our family vacations overseas. I'm taking nothing other than a change of clothes, my laptop, and important documents I took out of my father's office. I booked a flight that leaves in five hours, and I'm never coming back. I'm not even going to take my phone since I'd need to get a new number anyway. My best friend, God bless her, had been the one booking things and getting everything ready since I couldn't tip off my parents. She also smuggled some of my more important things that I can't take to hold onto for me. She's parking down the street, and I'll leave with my smallest suitcase to meet her. 
I don't know how they'll take this. I'm terrified they'll find a way to drag me back or to track me down. They went to bed over an hour ago, but I'm too anxious to sleep. I don't know if I'll have any updates, but I just hope they don't stop me. Update 2. I've left my family. Wow, so much has been happening lately that it's kept my head on a swivel constantly. I'll start with the good part of the update before moving on to the less happy bits. So, I was advised to remove the location destination from my post, so all I will say is that I'm in South Africa right now, and it's amazing. The food is astonishing, and a poster here messaged me to recommend that I try bunny chow, which is actually authentic curry in a bread bowl. It was phenomenal. I got to chatting to one of the hotel staff, she's about my age, and we really hit it off. She went with me to a local shopping center to get some new and better clothes. At least I'm used to wearing dresses, so that doesn't faze me, and they're very lightweight and breathable, unlike a lot of US dress fabrics. She also told me to shake out my shoes every morning just in case. I've started apartment hunting, and it's well within my budget, like super low compared to how sky high it is in the US. It's honestly jaw-dropping, like $81 for a studio apartment with a loft and kitchenette. So yeah, housing won't be an issue, and it's a bit odd to be house shopping for myself when I've always lived with my parents. Now on to the less pleasant bits. I finally opened the emails, deciding that it was best to probably get it over with. My father's email was filled with anger. There's no other way to put it. He said that by taking off irresponsibly like I did, cost them the friendship of someone they'd planned on introducing to me. He never admitted that it was a 53-year-old that they had basically sold me to. Father stated that because of the social relationships that have been damaged and impacted by my actions, I owe them approximately $85,000 in reparations. He also claims that he will be taking me to court if I don't pay it in full within 30 days and return home, as I obviously cannot be trusted. I plan to ignore that, as I believe him to be bluffing. He ended his email slash rant with, You belong to me, and I won't tolerate such defiance when we've put a roof over your head and taken care of you for your entire life. You were never the child we expected. It's time you make up for your deficiencies. I expect you home within the next two weeks. Yeah, nah. My siblings were basically copies of my father's email, admonishing me for throwing the efforts of our parents in their faces before running off like a coward, unwilling to face the fallout of my actions. I just skimmed them, honestly, before just deleting them. It's nothing that I didn't expect. However, my sister-in-law, she's married to my eldest brother, sent her own email before asking me to not reply as she would be deleting every sign that she sent it from her end. She congratulated me on stepping out on my own and getting away from my parents and their demands. She said that she herself hadn't been strong-willed enough to stand up to her parents when they basically betrothed her to my brother, which makes sense as I remember that they met and then married within six months, and even then, I thought that was a bit strange. She pleaded with me not to return and not to reply. That was it. It was a bit unnerving, honestly, as I do believe her, and I'm sad that she's stuck the way she is. The last email was from my best friend. She said that the morning after I flew out, my parents had been on their doorstep demanding to see me. Apparently, they believed I was hiding with her. They refused to leave, screaming for me to stop pretending I wasn't there. It caused enough of a scene that the police were called, but they only talked to my parents briefly and let them leave. It really angered my friend, who'd wanted them arrested for threats and trespassing. The police only claimed that there wasn't a pattern of behavior that would warrant them being arrested and charged, before just leaving. She didn't know when they realized I wasn't there at her house, but they didn't come back, thankfully. However, word has spread of me fleeing the safety of my parents' home, and how they wanted me to return, as they were concerned and fearful of what may happen with me out on the streets alone. The church ward has actually done searches of the area trying to find me. I don't know what they'll do from here, but they have no idea that I left the country, let alone the state. My friend has no plans to say anything, and neither do I. As far as I'm concerned right now, they can live with that state of wondering for the rest of eternity. 
I don't think I'll renounce my US citizenship, as there may come a day where I need it and it's better to be safe than sorry, but I have full plans to gain dual citizenship as soon as I'm able to. That's it for now, no other plans yet, but if anything changes, I'll let you know. I want to thank you all for your comments and private messages. It feels like I've got friends and family on my side, and I cannot tell you how much that means to me. Truly, thank you, all of you. Update 3. So much advice and support from everyone, I cannot thank you all enough. I thought with all the comments and questions I thought I'd answer here and explain what's happened since my last post. Ironically, my use of maths, instead of just math, comes from my mother who is British and met my father in England when they were 22. Second is people questioning why I chose South Africa and Johannesburg of all places because of how dangerous it can be. I do understand the risks, but there is nowhere on this planet that is inherently danger-free. Africa is massive and incredibly diverse, finding someone would be very difficult, and because those videos got so much attention, I've left Johannesburg sadly. I'm very far away, though obviously still in Africa. The area that I'm in now is incredibly safe and came highly recommended by several people. Settling here will be very comfortable and the people are wonderful. I may even attend the university here and get a degree. I haven't replied to the emails, but I have saved them and printed copies and am laminating them just in case. I will not be renouncing my US citizenship and my passport is good for another 8 years. I don't hate religion regardless of what it is. In my eyes, a person's relationship with God is incredibly personal. If a person connects with him via camping or walks, long drives, listening to music, acts of service, that's their choice, and it's just as valid in my opinion as sitting in a pew is. Possibly more, as they're honest with themselves instead of just putting on a false facade for the public eye. I plan on ignoring any further emails from my family, other than printing them out just in case. They've also made several phone calls to my friend, who has had fun with them. The first time your father called yelling that I hand you over, I pretended to be cowed and gave him your location. It took him to a strip club. He came back screaming at how I had embarrassed him. I just hung up on him honestly. She did that each time they called, giving a different location every time. Her favorite was sending my parents to a nudist retreat. My mother passed out apparently. My friend is looking to move and eventually plans to join me, but will jump around a bit so they don't follow her to me. I did finally read my uncle's email, but it was just a copy of my father's with the added comment that he and his fellow cops would be looking for me to bring me home safe before I got myself in trouble and hurt. I'm being watchful, and I know better than to wander into dark alleyways and abandoned places. That's all I've got for now. If anything changes, I'll let you all know. It's heartwarming seeing and reading how many people are on my side and in my corner. I've actually begun printing out everyone's messages and comments to put in a binder that I can look back on later. Truly, thank you all. I mean it. On being forced to marry even though OP is an adult, OP says, Pressure via local church wards. It is easier to move on when I don't have them standing over me forcing their choices in place of my own. I honestly don't know if I'd be strong-willed enough to stand up to my father in person just yet. Maybe one day in the future when I know who I am outside of what I've been forced to be. Update 4 Hello everyone, it's been a while since my last update, and a few things have happened that I was told by my friend that I needed to share since everyone was still clearly rooting for me. I have settled in a bit here, and am now enjoying the fun of paperwork. Oh, so much paperwork! I've secured an apartment, and while it's two bedrooms, one is for my friend when she comes to join me. I've made a few acquaintances here locally, and am beginning to stand on my own for a bit. My biggest challenges have been dealing with feeling uncomfortable because I don't know all of the unspoken rules the way I did in the US. As such, I'm constantly second-guessing myself, but hopefully that will fade with time. So, family. My family has learned that I left the state. How they did, I'm not sure. They do, however, seem convinced that I'm still in the continental US. My friend works as a cartoonist, and while she doesn't make a large amount of money, she makes more than enough to live comfortably. She is getting ready to leave herself, and decided to send my parents a… farewell gift. 
She didn't tell me about this until just a little bit ago. She spent a few hours carefully drawing my parents as they visited each location she sent them to, including their reactions, and all scenes were ended with the phrase, Abayed, abayed, abayed. That's all, folks. Sadly, while I've never seen the Looney Tunes, as she named it, she said she portrayed my father as similar to a coyote. I'm still not 100% sure what that means, but she said everyone else would. Before then ordering me to watch it. Maybe one day. She should be joining me at around October 9th, after country hopping several times. All the things she hasn't sold are in a secured storage unit, including the things that she's been holding for me. The biggest revelation came after my father. Well, he had a meltdown apparently after I never responded to him. He got into a fight with my mother in church, and many things were said. Among those, according to several, that my mother had cheated on my father, which, well, led to me. Which is why she never liked me, I guess, as I just reminded her of her mistakes. My father took her back in spite of that, but well, there it is. It caused a big stir in the ward, and meetings were held, though I obviously don't know what was said or done. I may never know, honestly. I'm trying to move on, and am even contemplating getting a tattoo. Part of me really wants to, while another points out that if I change enough, and my father finds me, he won't want me then. That's really all for now. I'm not sure if I'll have anything else to share, but if anything happens, I'll let you all know. Thank you all for the messages and comments. I do read them all, and it means more than you'll ever know. Am I the asshole for forcing my brother to buy me a new engagement ring? I, 26 male, am proposing to my girlfriend, 24 female, on our fourth anniversary, September 30th. I've been planning this for about a month, and I picked the ring a couple of weeks ago. The one I got was on sale, so I managed to get it at a surprisingly low price. Last weekend, I told my brother, 33 male, about my plans, and I showed him my ring. He informed me that he was proposing to his girlfriend, 29 female, as well. The next day, my brother came to my apartment while my girlfriend was out. He asked me if he could borrow my ring to propose to his girlfriend. I thought he was joking at first, but no. His plan was to propose to his girlfriend, explain he was using my ring as a placeholder, and then take her to pick her own ring later. His reasoning was that he didn't want to spend too much money right away, in case she didn't say yes. I'd never heard of placeholder rings, so I said no, and the conversation had moved on. On Tuesday, he proposed to his girlfriend. With my ring. He'd taken it before leaving my apartment. I got distracted at work and didn't notice it was gone until his fiance sent a picture of herself wearing the ring to our family group chat. I called him to ask about the ring, and he immediately apologized and said he'd keep his promise and give it back to me. But at this point, my girlfriend had seen it, and his fiancé had posted about it on social media, so it was pointless for me to propose using the same ring. We fought about it, and he confessed that while he'd told his fiancé the ring was a placeholder, he didn't tell her where he'd gotten it from. I felt more angry and betrayed about him going behind my back and taking the ring after I said no, rather than the fact that he stole it. I also know his fiancée enough to know that she wouldn't like to learn her engagement ring had been stolen from me. So I told my brother that I'd tell her the truth if he didn't buy me a new engagement ring. He fought against it for a few hours, but finally gave up and agreed. We went to a different jewellery store yesterday, and I picked a new ring. I managed to stay in the price range, but the new one was still $100 more expensive. My brother bought the ring, but is still accusing me of being inconsiderate and childish. He is insistent that he would have given me the ring back had I given him the opportunity, and I didn't need to threaten him to spend so much money on me. He is now refusing to talk to me. I don't know how to feel about this anymore. I'd usually talk to my brother about these things, and it's surreal that he's the one that I'm fighting. I can't tell my girlfriend, and many of our friends overlap. The only other person who knows about this is our mom, who's divided. She thinks what my brother did was wrong, and I'm right to be pissed at him, but I didn't have to stoop as low as I did by threatening his relationship. Am I the asshole? Edit, accidentally called my girlfriend fiancé. I'm proposing to her on Saturday. I can't tell her about this because I wanted the proposal to be a surprise. In the comments, someone asks, 
Does Bro have some illness or impairment that could excuse this, or is he just the worst? OP says, He's actually never done anything like this before. We usually have a great relationship. He was the first person I wanted to tell when I first started dating my girlfriend, and that I'm proposing to her now. There's no way both fiancés won't find out, so make sure to tell your girlfriend, soon to be fiancé. And OP replies, I'll definitely tell her, but only after I propose. I'm considering telling my brother's fiancé as well, but I haven't decided yet. I will tell my girlfriend after I propose. I spent a lot of time planning a proposal that she would like, and I don't want this situation to get in the way. We've been talking about our future together, marriage, kids, and careers, for a while now, so this is really important to me. What are you going to do if your girlfriend wants that original ring? OP says, I actually think she'll like the new one better. I personally prefer it, but it might be because it was even harder to look at the first one now. How long have bro and his girlfriend been together? OP says, three years, give or take. On parents, OP says, my dad died five years ago. I'm still talking to my mum about this, and she seems to be leaning towards my side, but I'll put more distance between us if she decides to side with my brother. tyler for you 2 says, not the asshole. Your brother created this entire situation and is 100% at fault. If it were me, I'd make all four parties sit down and explain everything. You might as well rip the band-aid off now, because it's going to come out sooner or later. It'll be much worse if it's later. Damn right, call his ass out. Fiancé deserves to know that her man pulled all this nonsense. I would be livid to find this out after getting married if I was the fiancé. She deserves to know the truth about the man she's planning to commit to before she makes that commitment. Not the asshole. He stole your ring. That was a choice he made, and it's also the choice that is threatening his relationship, not your reaction and words. It's completely fair if you never trust him again, since he also decided that having that ring was more important than a good relationship with you. If I was the brother's fiancé and found out, which she will, I would be giving that ring back ASAP and breaking up because I could never trust him again. To have one's proposal of marriage tainted by a theft and a lie seems like more than any marriage could overcome or should have to. Yeah, it just doesn't make any sense to me as to why the brother decided to do this. Why did the proposal have to be so rushed? Like, why did he have to steal OP's ring in order to do the proposal? There is no time limit on when this proposal happens. You just saw they had a great ring, and you were one-tracked minded about it, even after he told you no. I hate that family members like the mother in this instance could potentially swing to the side of the brother and go against OP when it's so obvious the sibling is such an asshole in this instance. And I truly hope it doesn't go that way, but as it is right now, I'm going to say not the asshole. Update. First, the good news. My girlfriend and I are engaged. I proposed to her on our anniversary, just as I'd planned. She said yes, and we both cried. I love this woman, and I can't wait to marry her. Also, my brother is single. A couple of days after my post, my mum called me and apologised. After thinking it through, she realised that while I did threaten his relationship, my brother had brought it upon himself. She confronted him the next day, and he ended up confessing that he wasn't going to propose until I said I was. My brother is older, but I've hit many more milestones earlier than him. He never seemed bitter about it. We've always been close and supported each other, which is why I was completely blindsided by what he did. Finding out that I was proposing made him panic. He spontaneously said he was doing so too, but freaked out about picking an engagement ring and devised a new plan that, according to him, made sense at the time. Use mine and take his girlfriend to buy a new one later. The plan was ruined when I said no, so he stole my ring. The new plan was to propose with it, take her to buy a new one, find an excuse to visit me the next day, and discreetly return the ring to my apartment. I wasn't even supposed to know that it was gone. That plan was also ruined, due to his girlfriend's immediate announcement. He knew she was doing it, but not that she'd show the ring. Then he got mad that I made him get a new ring, because he'd told his girlfriend he'd get her one too. So his plan to spare himself the effort of choosing an engagement ring would end up making him buy two. 
Basically, my mom got him to admit this whole engagement was a panic move. She said he'd already seemed embarrassed when they started talking, but was a wreck by the time they were done. She told him to apologize to me, and he called me an hour later to do so. He seemed sincere. Many of you said his girlfriend deserved to know the truth, and I agree. The only reason I hadn't done so was because I thought that should come from my brother, so I took the opportunity to tell him that if he truly loved her, he would tell her the truth. He did. I don't know much of what was said, but she dumped him. He gave me back the first ring and refused to offer to pay him back what he'd spent on the new one. As some of you recommended, I waited two days after proposing to tell my fiancé what happened. She was furious, but reassured me that she loved her ring more than any other. Since the first one was on sale, I can't return it to the store, so we're thinking of selling it. I haven't forgiven my brother, but because he's never done anything like this before, I'm willing to give him another chance. I'm going low contact for now. He'll have to earn my trust back. I really hope he does. I love him. I don't want our relationship to end over what he did. Both my fiancé and my mum agree with me on this. There's more that I want to add, but the word limit's not helping. I'll try to reply to more comments this time. Thank you all. In the comments, Buttercup Grump says, Congrats, I really hope your brother learns from this whole fiasco. And OP says, Me too. There's a part of me that still can't believe this even happened. Did you change your lock so your brother can't get in your place again? And OP says, He never had a key to my apartment. He stole the ring while he was visiting me and my back was turned. Honestly, sell the other ring and put the money towards your wedding or honeymoon. Yeah, that seems like the best course of action. Engagement rings have terrible resale value, from half the price to a quarter if you bought from somewhere like Kay's or Jared. You might be better off keeping it and giving the ring to your future child. It would make a lovely graduation gift for a daughter. What milestones were you talking about, OP? And OP says, they were mostly life milestones, really. I moved out at 24, he lived with our mum until last year. I was the first to have a long-term relationship with my now fiancé. He's accomplished a lot in life, just not as soon as I did. What the hell was your mum thinking before? OP says, she later said that she didn't know what she was thinking, but I get that it was kind of a tough spot. I think the main reason she tried playing Switzerland at first was because she's not used to us fighting. Someone suggests therapy to your brother, and OP says, he's already seeing a therapist, but I did suggest that he talk about this with her. On the bro's ex-girlfriend, OP says, I feel awful for her. She's a great person and really did love my brother. Had he not pulled this stunt, they could have had a great life together. You could keep the first ring as a backup and replacement for holidays, or if she doesn't want to wear it for festivals, concerts, etc. And OP says, That sounds like a great idea. When I asked my fiancé what she wanted to do with the first ring, she said she preferred the second one, but I'll suggest that and see what she thinks. It's safe to say, your brother won't be the ring bearer at your wedding. And OP says, <laughs> Yeah, we'll have to save that role for someone else. I really hope we've worked things out by the time my wedding comes along. What did you not include in your post, due to word count, that you wanted to? OP says, Mostly some more details on how I felt about this, as well as my fiancé. I feel like this post was very matter-of-fact, which is not usually how I write things. I think I managed to include everything I wanted in the comments, though. Our next post is by user BFF slept with sis, titled, 